Good evening, everybody. Glad to be here. Good evening, Mom.
Shobit, can we start now? Irosha? Hello, yeah, we are starting, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. hello, Nirosha. Yes, sir. Yeah, please, please start. Okay. So, good morning and good evening to one and all present here. I am Nirosha Suresh Babu, standing here on behalf of the Alpha Forensic Group to welcome you all to this amazing session of an international web webilog based on current, current, current forensic toxicology practice with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our organizers being the Alpha Legal and Forensic Access Private Limited, Alpha has emerged as a great reckoning force and a dynamic forensic organization at the dawn of this century. Alpha is established by highly qualified and experienced forensic professionals to provide best forensic investigation and education services and proper advice and guidance to its clients for a better balance of forensic science expertise at various places. Alpha is a government registered organization and that is a highly respected independent forensic science expertise or service provider in India. We also have another organize, organizer that is the Indian Association of Medical Legal Expertise as well. Today, we are accompanied by our media partners, RJ37 News, Sunshine Airlines, N Bharat Desh Kinam, Janamath News, Desh Watan, Safal Hint News, Sarthak Welfare Society, Ain Anubhav India, Desh Chetana Hindi Newspaper, and also Samajik Satta. Now, I would also like to welcome our moderator, Professor Dr. Adarsh Kumar sir as well. We have a few instructions to be followed during the entire session. I request all of you to please mute your mics while, uh, mics while the presenters are presenting. I also request everyone to be seated in a proper position if willing to on, if willing to on the video. Otherwise, please keep your videos off. Over to you, Adarsh sir. Thank you, Nirosha. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants from all over the world. I can see the participants are from right from US, Egypt, Indonesia, UK, everywhere. So time zone differs from place to place. And I can see the galaxy of the stalwarts of forensic medicine as well as my good friend, Dr. Nitin from UK, Dr. Mosri from Egypt, Dr. UD from Indonesia, and Dr. Deepa Verma, ma'am, Director, Forensic Science Lab, Delhi itself. Welcome you all to, for this very important uh, webinar on the forensic toxicology. Nilosha, I'm uh, audible to everyone. Am I? Yes, sir, you're audible. You're audible. Yeah, because some, something was going on that, uh, yeah, okay. Because somebody was saying that your the voice is not audible. Okay, so this, uh, in fact, this weblog was planned one month earlier, but because of uh, certain uh, uh, mis happenings, uh, it was postponed to this. Otherwise, this was planned last month itself. And because of the availability and convenience of all the speaker, now ultimately it could be materialized today. The speakers have so been chosen from uh, the different countries. Our first speaker will be from Egypt, next will be from Turkey, and then it will be from India, and then followed by uh, UK, and then lastly USA because of the time zone. Because the USA, it is just the morning has just started. So just to introduce you the first speaker, I welcome Dr. Noha Magdi El Rafi from An Shams University, Cairo, Egypt. She will be speaking on forensic toxicology from Egyptian perspective during this COVID pandemic. She is a faculty of forensic medicine toxicology at An Shams University, Cairo. 
she is also an icu specialist at the poison control center and also pursuing her phd with the university of nottingham uk she is executive assistant of international relations and academic collaboration sector of n uh, n shams university mena and famer fellow and she has recently been appointed as a director of n shams university projects unit i will take this great pleasure to invite dr noha magdi el rafi who is a very good friend of mine from so many conferences we have met and she is i found her very enthusiastic young budding forensic toxicologist interacted at so many forum so i requested her to share this her experience of forensic toxicology functioning in egypt and if, if there has been some change during this covid pandemic dr noha please so i nirosha can you just give this share hello everyone can you hear me yes can you hear me okay well it's uh, as you said good afternoon good morning good evening uh, wherever you're listening to us from of course uh, i can't say anything after the great introduction by my very beloved great friend uh, dr darsh kumar we've been as he says great friends and we're actually looking forward to meeting each other soon i really hope after the era of covid-19 um and uh, uh, thank you so much for having me here today and for inviting me to this weblog i will start sharing my screen now So can you all see my screen? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Okay, I'll just stop the video for better connection. Okay. Uh, so um, I found in the chat that there is a great diversity from uh, a lot of countries, which is uh, great that we're going to share these experiences together. I will be talking about the toxicology practice uh, in Egypt, a national perspective from uh, the Egyptian point of view. So actually, this is Egypt. It's actually the uh, Arab Republic of Egypt. Egypt is uh, a transcontinental country spanning uh, the northeast corner of Africa and the southwest corner of Asia. Egypt consists of 27 governorates, and I'm going to tell you in a minute uh, the implication of this on our toxicology services. So what's the problem? Of course, we came here in order to uh, have some discussions about the uh, toxicology perspective in different countries. So in Egypt, primarily poisoning is considered either the third or the fourth most common uh, mode of suicide, uh, being in females more than uh, males. And actually, the third or fourth depends on the timing of these studies. So uh, some studies were conducted in different years. Uh, and also according to the geographical distribution. So sometimes when there is um, a different geographical distribution from Upper Egypt to Lower Egypt, the, Swiss, uh, the poisoning becomes maybe the third or the fourth uh, most common mode of suicide. We also face a major problem of drug addiction. It's a serious problem in Egypt. It affects our community, especially in young teenagers in their productive years. It's also associated with many problems, social decreased work productivity, and the, also uh, the, high, the very high incidence of car accidents we have here in Egypt. Also substance abuse is a very common problem in the adolescent in Egypt. Tobacco, of course, cigarette smoking is the most common. We have also alcohol, organic solvents, cannabis is also very commonly used. Uh, cannabis is very, very commonly used in Egypt, especially among uh, students and among uh, a lot of uh, teenagers or people in their uh, middle ages. And also recently, and I will be talking about this in details uh, in a minute, we have been facing an era where the designer drugs are now taking over the conventional drugs. So uh, we, don't lo we no longer see the um, a chemical components of drugs that can be so easily detected or so easily um, seen as a clinical syndrome or clinical manifestations. So this will be a problem or this also causes us a lot of problems because we can detect them via laboratory and also uh, there are a uh, lack of the clinical reports uh, regarding the reporting of these uh, drugs, the designer drugs. So uh, actually, which comes first, the, uh, the uh, substance abuse or the depression? There are additional factors that, aggra uh, that aggravate the state of depression in youth, especially among uh, the young females in, uh, in the area in Egypt. The increase of drug abuse among youth. 
So it's so much difficult to explain whether the drug abuse increased uh, the depression or whether the depression led to this uh, drug abuse. Uh, these are the categories of the toxicology facilities in Egypt. So basically, we have uh, three kinds of categories. First of all, the centers in the university hospitals or the freestanding facilities. And I will be taking you in a minute uh, on the Egypt's map in order to explain this part. Uh, there are seven centers actually in university centers. They're freestanding facilities, meaning that they have their inpatient, their ER, their ICU, so they can uh, receive the cases and give them all kind of emergency treatment or intense treatment. The second thing is the uh, poison treatment units uh, by the Ministry of Health and Population uh, Hospitals. So these are about 30 centers that are scattered all over the country, but unfortunately they are, may act as information centers or they have their laboratory units. They can offer very minimal treatment, but unfortunately sometimes we cannot admit patients there if they need intense care. And there is also the private sector, which is not, uh, um, uh, let me say, uh, there are some private hospitals that assign some of the doctors that work either in the university hospitals or in the poison treatment units in order to see the cases and treat them in their uh, centers. But they are not available, of course, in all the uh, private sector in Egypt. Um, I will take you here to the Egypt's map. So, here you can find that the centers in university hospitals are scattered in this part of the country. There are two centers in Cairo, one center in Alexandria, one center in Tanta, and others scattered in, uh, this is Lower Egypt, and only one center here in the Minya in uh, Upper Egypt. So, and this is a problem. So if you see, this is the, the whole country. We only have seven university uh, hospital centers that are freestanding facilities. So the distribution is not um, very well favoring the uh, toxicology practice. And I will be talking to about strategies in order uh, that we have done in order to overcome this problem. Thank you. So uh, I, as I mentioned, there are three major uh, toxicology centers in the country. Uh, at the Poison Control Center of Ain Shams University Hospitals and the Poison Control Center in Cairo University and the one in Alexandria University. These are the major three of the seven that I've already mentioned. These are the ones that have the um, uh, huge services and a lot of number of beds that can serve a lot of people um, in the areas that uh, they serve, Cairo and Alexandria. So what are the services that are provided by these uh, university centers? Of course, we provide treatment, whether treatment to the acute cases, uh, if they need uh, only minor treatment or observation or major treatment and ICU admissions. Consultations, whether they are consultations uh, from um, uh, uh, the toxicology, so we can go to other uh, hospitals in the uh, same area in order to offer our toxicology consultations. And we can also bring others from uh, other uh, specialities in order to consult us uh, uh, in our patients. The referral, if we found that the patient just finished the toxicology treatment, so we can refer the patient to other a facility or other um, uh, hospital. Lab testing, and of course, I will be talking also about the uh, part regarding the laboratory testing. We have our own uh, chromatography unit where we uh, perform uh, either uh, testing for the therapeutic uh, levels of the drugs or for the overdose of certain drugs. Awareness, and I will be talking also about this, integrated services because we're connected, uh, the poison control center is connected to, in the university hospital, it's connected to all the other hospitals in the same university, so we can offer integrated services. Data and statistical analysis, and of course, a research for the, um, uh, the toxicology doctors in order to report the cases. So one of the problems that have been facing in Egypt is the new emerging drugs of abuse, the synthetic cannabinoids like the voodoo. And here are some pictures uh, of it. It has many different names, spice, uh, K2, fake weed, whatever, black mom and Mr. Nice Guy. The problem, as I mentioned, of these synthetic cannabinoids is that they are not easily detected because we don't have the exact tests in order to detect them. Um, uh, when the patients take them. Also, there is another drug called the uh, Strox. So it is a synthetic cannabinoid as well. Uh, Strox are, uh, they are easily available through the internet in smoke shops and even in the street markets. And unfortunately, in order to escape the uh, law enforcement, these um, herbal products are often labeled, they are not for human consumption. 
So um, as the legislations, they will find this kind of label. So it's okay for any, any other person to buy it. Early reports of stroke toxicity uh, presenting to our uh, center dated back to uh, January uh, 27, uh, 2017, and it's a cheap drug that threatens our youth. What about the missing info? So there are some problems regarding these uh, synthetic uh, cannabinoids and also other problems concerning other uh, drugs. So the baseline number of users uh, for these synthetic drugs are not um, very accurate because you know that uh, a lot of people just don't like to report the um, uh, taking the drugs because they're afraid that they might be get caught. Uh, drugs or, or uh, synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, so I will be talking uh, a little bit or shedding the light on the Poison Control Center at Ancient University Hospitals. Um, actually, it has been uh, mentioned to be the one of the earliest poison treatment facilities established in the Middle East. We have our own inpatient ICU analytical toxicology unit and we serve between 20 to 25,000 cases per year. More than 50 cases range from 15 to 40 years old, of course, with female predominance, especially in middle age. About 70% of them reside in Cairo and 30% of them from uh, another uh, governorate. The annual reports show that most common addiction drugs are tramadol and cannabis. Uh, their order actually varies from one year to another and according to the availability and the price. So according to the uh, market and the stock. The top three exposure substances uh, in our center are the bacterial food poisoning, organophosphorus intoxication, and detergents or corrosives, what we call the household uh, products. In chemical poisoning, the most common always uh, was the pesticides, with, of course, the organophosphorus intoxication topping the chemical list. So what's new? What happened during the uh, COVID-19 era? First of all, starting March, the number of household poisoning skyrocketed since the start of the COVID era. The numbers are almost doubled every month. The cases are always coming because the um, people at home are using the alcohol, the detergents, the um, sulfuric acid, the potash, and things that are no longer uh, being used in most of the countries. We use them. And this was manifested in this case. It was uh, She was a child, and uh, actually she... Uh, her mother went on uh, TV because she put the um, uh, sulfuric acid in a container that was different from the container uh, and it was not properly labeled, which led the child to have this severe manifestations, which is a very common problem in Egypt. Also, the number of food poisoning cases decreased because, of course, we had the curfew closure of the restaurants for a long period of time, so people did not eat outside. So uh, the food poisoning cases decreased ultimately. Also because of the flight suspension, poisoning with and addiction on the drugs and chemicals that are important, like the voodoo and the strokes that I was talking about became much less, which is basically the good thing. But unfortunately, the importing of, uh, uh, of the antidotes was affected as well, which is the bad thing because we have a lot of our antidotes imported from different countries. So uh, also I've been mentioning some pitfalls in the treatment in Egypt. First of all, we uh, and I found this on the social media. On it's it's very common knowledge that whenever you ingest anything, just use salt and water in order to induce vomiting. Of course, we know that salt and water is uh, very dangerous to be used because it causes hypernatremia and it causes brain edema. Unfortunately, this is a very common practice uh, in Egypt. Of course, not not by the doctors, but by the lay people who don't have the knowledge. Second thing is mixing detergents, especially during the COVID, we have seen many cases big mixing detergents with vinegar, lemon, other substances, causing uh, some respiratory symptoms and distress because uh, putting all these together, the bleach and with the vinegar and the other toxic uh, substances. 
induction of vomiting. So whenever they, uh, uh, anyone uh, ingests anything, just put your hand in your mouth and induce vomiting. Even we found some moms doing this to, to their children without even knowing if this is the right practice or not. But it's also a common uh, uh, pitfall in the uh, knowledge of the lay people in Egypt. Uh, giving atropine as antidote, and unfortunately this happens in some hospitals that uh, don't have the uh, uh, toxicology uh, proper practice or guidelines, so they give just atropine as a universal antidote to any cases of pesticides. Regarding that, no, atropine has its own considerations and own guidelines. And finally, the ligature of the snake bites and scorpion stings to the extent that they may cause gangrene in some uh, of their limbs. So uh, ligature can be done, but it has its own um, guidelines and should be done by a doctor, not just done by, by anyone who just ties the leg or ties the limb and causes the cut off the, of the blood supply. And we found a lot of cases that uh, with decreased vascularity because of the improper ligature of the snake and the scorpion. Think about and the scorpion. So what are our efforts that uh, we have done in order to face these? As you can find in this picture, we have a lot of uh, educational videos about, I'm, I'm sorry, of course, they're in Arabic, but I got them from the actual sites uh, because this was targeted to the Egyptian population. So on the upper left corner, this is the uh, botulism poisoning. <clears throat> and you can find some educational videos uh, about uh, uh, how to treat it or what to do. Uh, hello? Uh, here you can find that uh, we are asking in the uh, bottom left corner to telling people not to use salt and water. Uh, this is actually on the uh, door of our poison control center. In the middle, you can find uh, the uh, uh, toxin by uh, the uh, tox uh, right side. The uh, uh, the uh, tramadol and the addiction. Finally, I would like to end with uh, some uh, recommendations for, um, in order for the services to be um, improved. I'm sorry, can you just uh, mute your mic because there is a lot of background noise. I, I can't, I can't uh, talk properly. Please, can you mute, mute your mics? Thank you. So, um, number one, uh, we uh, need training programs to the physicians and raising awareness of the public in order to decrease the possibility of exposure as well as enhancing the proper action in case of poisoning. Second, the legislation should be implemented to ban over-the-counter selling of medications and sell the potentially danger dangerous chemicals in child-proof containers uh, and also teach the children the elements of safety. Unfortunately, in Egypt, we don't have these child-proof containers. Uh, the third thing is the multi-century studies and collaboration between the poison control center over the country, which is necessary in order to provide a nationwide surveillance about the pattern of poisoning in Egypt, outlining a unified protocol. Uh, the poison control center also respond to questions from the public and healthcare professionals through information services, which is actually being done. We have our own information center now develop unified diagnosis and treatment guidelines. And actually, our uh, the director of the uh, center, the Poison Control Center at NHMC University has been having a lot of uh, meetings with the partners from UK in order to form a unified diagnosis and treatment guidelines for the uh, toxicology practice in Egypt. Further studies, of course, should be done on the clinical cases supplemented by animal experimental studies and finally, use the intense power of the social media in order to ensure the success and increase the uh, awareness of the community. And we have started uh, doing, been um, working on further studies. And we hope, of course, after the end of the COVID-19 to collaborate with all the um, uh, other partners that will help us to uh, improve our toxicology practice in Egypt. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Noah. Hello. 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 Yeah. Yeah. First, I will uh, I'll request you to just transfer the host position to to the uh, Nilosha. Just transfer the host position so that the participants uh, who are waiting, they can be admitted. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah. Just transfer it to Nirosha. Okay. Nirosha, can you guide her how to do that? So trying to do that. So... I think you have to just go in the names and there you can just you have just that option. Nirosha, can you explain to hello, her? Hello, hello. Yeah, show me. Yes, yeah. Hello. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. You will get a participants option at the bottom of the window. Yeah, I can find the participants. Yeah, when you click on that option, participants option, there will be a list of participants. Yeah, I just, I know, I just then, can't find Nerosa. Yeah, then go to the, yeah. Uh, if you are not finding Nerosa, then you can click on Alpha Lab, if you can see there. Oh, just yeah, make okay. me the host, yeah. Was... yeah. Okay, because I can't find her, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Noha, for this nice elucidative talk. And uh, I will definitely agree with you that uh, so many problems what uh, Egypt is facing, I think more or less India is also having the same problem when we talk about the management of the poisoning. So very nicely covered. Uh, extremely thankful okay. to you. And uh, now after uh, this, uh, because uh, we are already uh, uh, behind the schedule, but then I can allow one or two questions. If there are one or two questions, otherwise we can take it in the last. So if there are some few pressing questions, from the any of the participants. If they are, they can just unmute their mic and they can just ask the question. Rest of the participants, please, please continue muting uh, your mic because that takes the bandwidth and then uh, the connection becomes a little bit poor. The reception is not that good. So whoever wants to ask, just unmute his or her mic and then ask the question. Okay, I, I think we will take the questions uh, in the last itself. I think that will be better. So thank you, Noah, uh, from Egypt. Now the, the Egypt is, was the ancient, most ancient country. Uh, <laughs> so from where, from uh, that country, we, I started intentionally to have the, the, the city, the country of Faroas and all that. Uh, it's a Thank beautiful you. I really country. It. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's one of the most beautiful country I have ever visited. And I think everybody just want to see those uh, pyramids of Egypt, Giza and <laughs> and uh, the lovely people over there. So thank you, Noha. And uh, so now moving from Egypt to gateway of Europe, the other, other country, that is Turkey. The, our next speaker is from Turkey, Dr. IBK Dib, uh, who did her PhD in forensic chemistry and forensic toxicology from Ankara University, Turkey. Uh, uh, she did uh, her uh, PDF postdoctoral fellowship from Southern University, Houston, Texas, USA. And then after working, uh, uh, she was, she continued her career in the forensic toxicology and she's taking care of the Tur Turkish Council of Forensic Medicine and uh, during her PhD she has got the you can say expertise on the alcohol metabolites by using those very high-end sophisticated instruments like LCMS, MS and also determination of uh, these uh, synthetic cannabinoid metabolites by QTQF. So uh, her next talk her this talk is going to be on the same aspect i requested her to speak on the advantages of qtqf that means the quadrupole time of flight in forensic analysis so welcome dr ibk and uh, yes she has been to india i can say uh, she was here in 2017 when the indian association of medical legal experts organized the conference in agra and uh, there was a huge contingent from turkey and that's how I met uh, Dr. Abike. She has been kind enough uh, 
to to share his uh, her views and her experience of working in that particular field the recent advances in the in the field of forensic toxicology to the participants today welcome dr abike thank you uh, dr kumar can you hear me yes i okay. think okay yeah. no problem yeah it's clear okay uh good evening everyone and thank you dr kumar uh, for inviting me uh, to this session and i will talk about of, uh but i cannot share my screen how can i share my screen uh, mom uh, you are the host now mom so you can share the screen now okay Okay. So, uh, I am working as um I'm working as forensic toxicologist in uh, Turkey Ministry of Justice Council of Forensic Medicine Chemistry Department. Uh, I will talk about advantages of quadrupole time of flight uh, in forensic analysis. In our forensic um, toxicology laboratory, we have postmortem cases and drug abuse cases. In postmortem cases, we use blood, urine, hair, nail, saliva, and all tissues for analysis, and we do alcohol analysis and drug and drug abuse analysis, insecticides, pesticides, some toxic substance. And in drug abuse cases, uh, we use uh, blood, urine, hair, nail, and saliva samples, and uh, we. We do alcohol analysis and uh, we analysis also abuse drugs. In our laboratory, we have postmortem cases and drug abuse cases, and we do some instrumentation. And for both cases, we use Headspace GCFID for alcohol analysis. And for postmortem cases, we use uh, GCMS uh, for uh, screening uh, of drugs and toxicology. Substance, and previously uh, we were using immunoassay methods uh, for drug screening. Now we change the methods to uh, LCQTOF instead of immunoassay drug screening. And why we do this? Previously we use immunoassay, uh, but uh, but uh, screening it. Um, some group of drugs, for example, opiates, benzodiazepines, amphetamines, uh, cocaine, but as a group, they give a result. And some the uh, disadvantages of immunoassay methods are they give uh, some false positive or false negative results. And instead of immunoassay, now we are using QTO for drug screening. Uh, so we just analyze um, the drugs itself instead of groups like morphine, codeine, glucuronides of them, diazepam, midazolam, amphetamine, methamphetamine, THC or cocaine, benzoylecoin, also they are metabolized, and uh, some med medicines and pesticides, insecticides, also synthetic cannabinoids. In just uh, using one cute of machine, we can do this drug screening uh, instead of using immunoassay analysis. So why we choose cute of? Uh, I want to talk about why we choose cute of instead of immunoassay. Firstly, we were using uh, for confirmation LC-MSMS. Uh, and I want to show some simple diagram for LC-MS. Uh, what we need is sample inlets, and we need an ion source, we create ions and then send to interface to vacuum and then to mass analyzer and a detector to get a signal output. 
In our laboratory, we use LCMSMS, uh, a lot of LCMSMS, but I want to put uh, ABCIX LCMSMS here because I use also ABCIX QTOF. In here, uh, we have a uh, turbo source here uh, from um, HPLC, the sample comes with mobile face to the uh, turbo source and then go inside to the instrument. In turbo source, there is atmospheric pressure. Um, there is atmospheric pressure. Uh, the sample comes from LC. Here there is, there is nebulizer gas here and high voltage and turbo, turbo heaters here. The samples droplets uh, turns to charge droplets here and evaporation occurs by turbo V heaters and ions create, created here and then go to the uh, quadrupoles by using this curtain gas. There is a curtain plate here uh, to the mass analyzer, to the quadrupoles. What is quadrupoles? A quadrupole mass filter this is quadrupoles. Mass filter consists of four parallel metal, metal rods with different charges. Two opposite rods have an applied positive potential and the other two has negative potential. The applied voltages affects the trajectory of ion traveling down the flight path. The ions selected here and follow this path by this quadrupole. So another diagram, and this is the turbo source, turbo. Uh, here, um, samples come from L HPLC and goes into the turbo source. Here, by heating and by high voltage, ion production occurs. And then ion transports by QC to the quadrupoles, Q1, Q2, and Q3. In here, in quadrupole one, uh, we have ion filtering, which means uh, we choose our molecules and our ions here, and then send to Q2. Q2, there is a linear accelerator. This is a collusion cell. Here, fragmentation occurs. The molecule uh, product ions occurs. Product ions occurs here, and then and then uh, sent to Q3, Q3, mm, and the product ions collect in Q3 and uh, sent to the detectors. This is a simple diagram. Here we have molecules, what we looking for here, uh, the MRM. This is the precursor ion and sent to the uh, Q2 for fragmentation and the product ions produced in Q3 and go to the detector. What is QTOF? QTOF, these, these were uh, for LC MSMS. In QTOF, uh, time of flight mass spectrometry is a method of mass spectrometry in which an ion mass to charge ratio is determined by time of flight measurement. Ions are accelerated by an electrical field of known strength. This acceleration results in an ion having the same kinetic energy as any other ion that has the same charge. The velocity of the ion depends on the mass to charge ratio. The time takes for the ion to reach the detector at a known distance is measured. This time will depend on the velocity of the ion and therefore is a measure of its mass to charge ratio. With this ratio and known experimental parameters, ions can be identified. What does it mean that? Here, QTOF system, is the same LCMSMS. Uh, we have turbo source to produce ions and we have quadrupoles, but we have extra uh, TOF analyzer here. In LCMSMS, we have Q1, uh, for precursor ion, we have Q2 for fragmentation, and we have Q3 uh, for MRM products and detector. But in QTOF, what we have instead of Q3? Principle of time of flight. Uh, in 
the, the ions are pulled and accelerated into, into TOF analyzer. Separation of ions based on time of time to fly through the electrical field free flight path on a nanosecond time scale. There are molecules, but uh, according to their mass ratio, they uh, move if, if they are smaller, they are heavier than move more faster than heavier ones. Where this happens in this TOF analyzer, instead of Q3, we have this TOF analyzer. There is no electrical field there. Uh, the molecules uh, follow a path according to their um, heaviest or smaller ones according to their weight. This gives us a high resolution. What is high resolution? High resolution mass spectrometry, any type of mass spectrometry where the exact mass of the molecular ions in the sample is determined as opposite to the nominal mass. This allows detection of analytes to the nearest 0.001 atomic mass units, particularly useful to differentiate between molecular formulas having the same nominal mass. Quadrupole time of flight mass spectrometry gives high resolution accurate mass data for full scan information of both precursor ion and all product ions. Okay. So what is the main difference between LC MSMS and QTOF? In LC MSMS, uh, before sample injection, we choose uh, what we are looking for inside the sample. And we have to say that uh, choose, for example, the molecular weight 225 and the MRM of this molecule, collect the MRM of this molecule. And LC-MSMS choose a precursor ion and then uh, collects the product ions. But in QTOF, uh, we don't say anything to QTOF. QTOF collects every data. They, they, they don't need to choose any precursor ion. They collect every precursor ion and every MRM products. So uh, we, don't, we don't need to choose uh, any ion before sample injection. Here's some examples. Uh, this is fentanyl result of LC-MSMS. What we do uh, with LC-MSMS, uh, molecular weight of fentanyl is 336, so 337. MRM product is 105 and 188. So this is fentanyl with two MRM uh, by LC MSMS analysis. But in QTOF, what we have is we have MRM spectrum here. You see there is 188, 105, the two MRM, two MRM of fentanyl, but you can see all MRM of fentanyl here, 134, 260. You can see a lot of uh, MRM pairs of fentanyl also as a spectrum, MRM spectrum. Another drug, uh, levotiracetam, you see uh, 170 molecular weights, so 171 products, 69, and one, uh, 126. This is LC MSMS MRM products. But in QTOF, we have 126 and 69 MRM pairs and also 58, also 90, 98 MRM pairs and MRM pairs spectrum. So we have more data instead of two, two MRM. For example, Salbutamol, we have 148, 121, 91, a lot of MRM pairs here. We can see MRM pair spectrum here. Another example, 
uh, asset summary page. By the way, we uh, we just use uh, one column uh, and same mobile face for both uh, insecticides, drugs, uh, abuse drugs, uh, for everything. We don't need to change method. We don't need to change duration or mobile phases or column. We just use one column and just 10 minutes duration, analysis duration time. We, we can uh, screening all of them at the same time. Here, acetamiprid MRM uh, pair spectrum and for THC, a lot of MRM results here. And by uh, TOF, we can create a huge laboratory. We can add uh, any new substance to the laboratory, uh, to the um, library, to the library. So we can uh, analyze uh, again the sample without doing injection. What it means, we can add a new substance to our processing method and without doing the sample injection again, we can uh, process and uh, search that this new substance inside the sample or not. Here is a summary, uh, the difference between them. In triple quadrupole, we can do quantitation identification with MRM ratio. In Q-trap, we can do uh, quantitation and identification with MRM ratio. Also, we can do library searching. In QTOF, in QTOF, uh, we can do quantitation uh, uh, identification with accurate mass, identification with uh, MSMS library, and we can analyze unknowns and we can use retrospective data processing. So the advantages of QTOF are increased mass accuracy and mass resolution, greater sensitivity, rapid acquisition, high resolution accurate mass data for full scan information for both precursors, precursor ion and all product ion, which means we don't have to uh, give any information about the molecules. It collects everything. Uh, so you can go back uh, to the analyst and you can do the process again. You can search new compounds in just one injection. So retrospective data processing is very useful because, you know, a lot of emerged drugs happening in markets, uh, new synthetic drugs and you can go back to the uh, injection, you can add new drug information and you can process your data again. And if there is, you can find the new drug in your sample. Uh, these are all I want to talk about QTOF advantages. I don't want to talk about too much theoretical thing. And uh, about Corona, I want to say that uh, it doesn't affect uh, our job. Our uh, case numbers are still high and they are staying at home and uh, still um, continue using drugs. And that's all what I want to share with you. Thank you for your listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Abike. Uh, nice, so much, nice presentation and extremely exhaustive. I think there must be so many questions from the forensic toxicologists from our lab. I can see Dr. Raki Khanna is there and uh, from uh, this uh, from FSL Delhi also. There are so many forensic toxicologists, but I think we will take the, all the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, thanks, Dr. Abike, for exhaustive and extremely valuable information. Uh, may I request you to please uh, this, uh, transfer your this host position to Shobit and request Shobit to allow the speaker, Dr. Pallavi Dubey is waiting from USA to let her in as well as Dr. Kanak Lata, probably she missed her connection in between and she also wants to be there included. 
because she is going to be our next speaker if she is there otherwise i will invite the next speaker okay what uh, what should i do ma'am yeah, uh, in yeah, the please make goes to alpha, alpha lab ma'am yeah. yeah uh there's an option uh, uh beside or symbol to make host like you can go click on alpha lab just go to the participant list and just tap alpha and there you can you have the option you can just click the host ek pen ko kagaz se dunga de raha what should i choose make host make host alpha lab yes, the yes, name alpha does one lab. name as alpha lab yeah Okay. Uh, Nirosha, you are the host now, actually. Nirosha is there. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, okay. So I think Dr. Kanak, our next speaker, uh, I can see her on the screen. So she is there. Okay. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kanak Lata Verma. Uh, she is the uh, assistant director in chemistry here in Delhi itself, Regional Forensic Science Lab, uh, Chanakya Puri, Delhi. Uh, she has done her phd in chemistry from jamia millia islamia in 1999 and uh, she is the resource person for international regional training on forensic drug analysis from india uh, this uh, and she is also a guest faculty on several central universities judicial academies and she is a certified assessor by the nabl that is the national accreditation of laboratories biological laboratories and she is the associate member of American Academy of Forensic Sciences also she has published numerous papers in various national and international journals and i have been fortunate enough to work with her and so many papers uh, of us we have jointly published also so uh, i i welcome uh, dr kanak lata uh, she will be speaking on the central theme of this today's webinar that is the forensic toxicology current practice and how it has affected in india of course uh, the presentations of the previous speakers from egypt and turkey i could see that uh, when you talk about the forensic toxicology there is not much difference in the practices uh, whether it was covid times or the earlier but i think dr kanak will agree with me that there is a lot of difference uh, in our setup so she will be touching uh, that aspect also uh, i welcome uh, dr kanak lata verma to give her presentation and request uh, nilosha to please make dr kanak the host please ma'am you are on mute yeah unmute yourself oh 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 yeah yes. am i audible yes, yeah 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 namaskar everyone and first of all uh, it's my honor to be associated with indian association of medical legal expert and the alpha forensic group thank you for providing me this platform and to address such a burning issue like covid-19 pandemic versus the current toxicology forensic toxicology practice i mean it's really a thought to ponder upon and as the uh, concept of the webilog goes that every uh, crisis is a harbinger of opportunity so i'll be talking with the indian perspective now can i share my screen please yes ma'am you are made the host you can share the screen ma'am sure. and nilosha r dr pallavi is there pallavi divedi No, she is not yet here, sir. No, I think she is. She she tells. She is telling that she has joined. Pallavi Divedi from USA. Is my screen on, uh, Nidosha? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So I represent Forensic Science Laboratory, Government of NCT of Delhi, and uh, I'm very honoured. Uh, to be a scientist working in this organisation. we have true time we have completed 25 years of dedicated service to the nation and uh, it's a huge thing and during this pandemic also like this uh, world has been actually divided into two zones time zones 
a pre-pandemic one and the one we are right now living in. So I'll be um, discussing with the, both the aspects I'll be covering with the Indian perspective. And when the entire nation was and the world was uh, under lockdown, the scientists of FSL Delhi were there true to the spirit working as Corona warriors. So topic is COVID-19 pandemic versus current forensic toxicology practice, the Indian perspective. So presently I'm posted at RFSL Chanakya Puri. So in India, generally, uh, Friends Forensic Science Laboratory comprises of uh, all these divisions on the screen. And uh, uh, this is the general setup for any uh, forensic science domain. And in FSL Delhi, the working division you can see on the screen. And uh, we have a 24 into 7 CSMD division, which was out there in the, uh, in the lockdown also. And they were covering the most sensitive uh, crime scenes, scene of crime. Uh, whether it is pandemic or not, it doesn't affect our duty. So normally chemistry division, forensic toxicology exhibits are deposited by law enforcement uh, agencies under sections of Indian Penal Code and criminal procedures regarding homicide, suicide, and DFSA, and DSA, child abuse, violence against women and others. So these are the uh, cases which are received in chemistry division and forensic toxicology is a part of that. Um, we re receive around 500 to 400 cases. I need a beam. 400 to 500 cases per month. Nature of the queries uh, mostly revolves around, as you can see on the screen, detection of uh, poisons, volatiles, inhalant poison, ethanol, detection of gaseous poison. narcotic drugs, pesticides, inflammable substances, metallic poison, corrosives, and any other specific query asked by the law enforcement agencies. Now the pre-pandemic scenario in FSLs. Mostly the nature of exhibits were viscera, including stomach, intestine, liver, kidney, spleen, blood. But now we have to lay emphasis on other, uh, you know, uh, Exhibits also like urine, gastric lavage, vitreous humor, nail and hair, non-invasive technique, very easy to remove. Bones, other biological exhibits can also be considered depending upon uh, the option being uh, weighed by the autopsy surgeons. He is the best person to understand the uh, criticality of the case. Non-biological exhibits recovered from the scene of crime, they are very important to and, uh, form the corroborative evidences. Food sample, fire debris, hand washing trap cases related to corruption cases, vitriolage, the acid throwing cases, crime against women again, tablets, medicine, vegetative parts, unknown chemicals, sprays, etc. Now, hand washing trap cases again, it's a very tricky issue because uh, around the world it has been, you know, uh, accepted that hand, uh, the palm of the hand is the place where you have maximum concentration of the uh, coronavirus. So, in case of trap cases, I think we need to be extra vigilant then. Next. Okay. So, chemistry division exhibits, there's just a snapshot of those uh, live exhibits which are, we have been receiving. We have been dealing with all kinds of NDPS drugs and uh, acid throwing incidences, as I told you, we get exhibits among them also, a very, very uh, pathetic situation for those who survive these uh, incidences. Then other exhibits, of course, the main, uh, you know, talk of the town is the viscera samples, a lot of viscera, spleen, kidney, stomach, intestine, heart, and all these are the boxes. Then there are samples uh, related to trap cases, as I discussed. Then uh, in India, we also, in India, in the Indian subcontinent, we also have a problem called bright burning, you know, the very gender skewed violence. And uh, under 498A section, we receive a lot of arson related cases also, wherein you receive garments of the bride, you know, in burnt condition, maybe singed hair, skin pieces. Then there are alcohol related cases. So these are the exhibits. So the analytical approach goes like, first of all, we go for acid and alkali distillation for analysis of volatile poisons. That's the classical method. And wet digestion for uh, drugs and pesticide, then LLE, 
for uh, separation and then after preliminary examination and all the sample preparation rigorous techniques we go for the higher end techniques as gchsms gcfid hplc ftir hptlc ms and uh, lcms all these techniques are present at uh, fsl delhi we also have some of the latest technique like gcir so we use these techniques for our analysis now covid 19 march 2020 onwards now we have to address the issues in this pandemic scenario regarding toxicological examination of exhibit i won't say everything changed but but yes lot of uh, it has changed and lot needs to be changed actually we need to have a paradigm shift as what to do and what not to do what to be considered critical safety and precautions for our scientists our healthcare workers remains topmost and also assisting in the justice uh, criminal justice delivery system that is our duty so we uh, always will stand with that so i'll be discussing on these aspects now yes covid 19 i'll not talk about uh, much because everything has been discussed for the last 6 months corona corona everyone is talking about corona so the tiny invisible enemy is challenging all of us and this is all about the disease yes this disease is grouped under high risk uh, group 3 where uh, prophylaxis uh, treatment is available but there is a high risk of community transmission so that holds good for the laboratory atmosphere as well next slide slide is not moving it is moved next has come next slide has come next slide has come it's there on the screen next slide is there that connect next slide is there but i think she is having some network issues so she left oh this happens the technology sometimes you are just stranded has she lost the connection yes sir oh that yes, means uh, maybe she, she, she may be allowed to join again and also allow uh, dr pallavi she is waiting and uh, she is continuously trying so maybe you you take the host position and just uh, allow both the speakers uh, i already uh, accepted everyone no just pallavi dubey i think she is there she just is telling me just let me search me. yeah no one is in waiting room sir right now okay okay let, let, let me ask her let me ask her i am here uh, dr adarsh i am here oh pallavi yeah, yeah, you are yeah. here okay yeah, yeah, okay yeah. okay that's good that's good so now you allow this dr kanak where is she please allow me yeah yeah yeah, yeah please wait
Uh, please proceed, ma'am. You are the host now. Yes. So uh, this slide, I think I covered. So uh, these are the possible risk areas during COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll straight away go to the chemical analysis part. Now at the uh, reception desk, case acceptance desk, laboratory case opening sections, and the individuals who are at direct risk. So this is the gray area which needs to be covered when we are talking about the challenge of COVID-19 pandemic uh, scenario and the forensic toxicologist working. So standard operating procedure for maintaining the laboratory pertaining to COVID-19. Dr. Kanat, your, your screen is not there. I think you have to click that share screen. Because nothing is there on the screen. Shared. Actually, I have shared. No, ma'am, it's not visible. Okay. Yeah, now, now it is coming. Yeah, now it has come. And now you can put on that uh, slideshow. Yes. 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 Is, yes, now it has come. Please has continue. Away. <laughs> yeah, now it is working but fine. Technical yeah. issues. Okay. So these are the safety gears and facilities required for scientific staff and some small equipment suggested in the Indian context. We need to have all these things. So uh, here it is to uh, remind that even in the BSL-2 lab, with BSL-3 precautions, we can deal with the positive cases also if uh, those exhibits uh, turn up. So a uh, time for technical upgradation in the analytical procedure. Yes, exhibit issues are there. This pandemic has given us the opportunity to review our analytical approach, hence room for improvement. So uh, this I'll be discussing in the next slides, okay. So here we have the guidelines uh, designed by the government of India, BPRND in 1990. You can see that the stomach and its content hole and kidney at least one was earlier suggested and the target poison and the specific sites were there. So uh, this was the one which happened in 1990 and later on, In 2005, Directorate of Forensic Science Services, again, we have, uh, that's the Bible for us in uh, India. Uh, we all FSL follow this uh, in spirit. So here again, bile is the new entry. CSF has been discussed, muscle tissues, fatty tissues. These are now, uh, uh, they can be also the exhibit of choice in forensic toxicology. There are a lot of publications peer reviewed and uh, findings has been uh, given on them that apart from the visceral organs, these tissues can also, these uh, exhibits can also uh, detect poison. So again, uh, when we discuss the uh, specimen collection, there's one uh, very basic book by Dr. K. S. Reddy and the 2010 edition, the liver you see from 450 gram, he has reduced it to 200 and uh, to 300 grams. Kidney half of each in case there is a malfunctioning in one of the kidney as suggested earlier that one kidney is sufficient. Blood again from 50 ml, it has come to 30 ml. Urine, all available, so 30 ml. VHF, uh, the VH, the vitreous humor is again the entry over here for uh, detection of uh, uh, ethanol and other volatile poisons and maybe drugs. And decomposed body issues has been uh, addressed by thigh muscles and pesticide and insecticide can be looked into for uh, the fat from the abdominal wall or the perineal region. So uh, this is basically a whole compilation of uh, the recent development which has been happening in the toxicology field. And I have cited all the uh, literature survey from uh, the latest one. So here, all the specific site addressed has been uh, urine or blood. So blood here, urine, uh, they can be very good samples, especially keeping in view the uh, pandemic uh, scenario, wherein the autopsy surgeon can decide whether it is really uh, needed to open the body or virtual autopsy can be one uh, option. So uh, for the toxicologist, uh, this sample of choice can also do justice to the target poison by using uh, the uh, hyphenated techniques or the other instrumental techniques, depending upon the poison we are looking for. Okay, so now the collection of viscera according, this is the comparison chart from 2005. Then we have the recommendation by the United Kingdom and Ireland Association of Forensic Toxicologists, which came in 2010 uh, and published in Science and Justice by Cooper et al. And keeping in view the pandemic scenario, this is uh, the, just, uh, the justification. So again, in this scenario, every corpse and cadaver can be taken as a potential source of infection. Again, the onus lies on the autopsy surgeon. Uh, you all are the best 
uh, you know, uh, to understand whether uh, what kind of exhibits are required, what is the uh, what is the history behind uh, the case, and uh, whether really the body needs to be open or uh, bile, urine, vitreous humor, and CSF can do justice to the case. So these can be really good samples uh, with the minimum contamination and possible risk uh, to the scientist working therein. So again, you can see that uh, peripheral blood has come to 10 ml, urine all available, and there is an asterisk that sample identified with an asterisk should only be submitted for analysis following discussion and agreement with the toxicology laboratory. This is a very, very good and very, very you know, welcoming suggestion for any toxicology working anywhere in the world in the present pandemic scenario. This can be uh, taken as a guideline. So. Uh, Okay, then I am discussing uh, with respect to around 3,040 cases, which we have analyzed at the regional lab. And uh, the segregation of cases according to the nature of query, uh, query has been, uh, as you can see on the screen with the chart. So it's like 50% alcohol related and the rest covered around 50%. And segregation of cases according to our finding again comes to 40%, we are able to detect alcohol only and 10, 10% and uh, uh, for drugs and pesticide, 2% for uh, other uh, metallic and gaseous poison uh, positive cases and 4% for other like uh, acid or floor cleaners or chemical, unknown chemicals and so forth. And uh, in this cases, there is a that 34% that needs to be addressed. That can be, I think, uh, in our view, uh, by adopting uh, higher end techniques and better extraction procedures. So again, uh, our findings are again corroborative, uh, corroborated by the findings uh, uh, conducted by the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Forensic Medicine and Toxicology India, uh, under guidance of Professor Adarsh Kumar. So two of the research scholars, Dr. Pallavi Choudhury and Dr. Krishan Kumar Singh, uh, in 2019 and 17 respectively, have conducted this uh, uh, study. And in this, the sample of choice was blood, vitreous humor, and cerebrospinal fluid. And the results were well in alignment with the, uh, the amount of alcohol find in, uh, found in the blood. So in cases where blood is not available, vitreous humor and CSF can also be good samples. And the study was well enough because uh, around 200 uh, uh, sample size was there for uh, Pallavi's study, Dr. Pallavi's study, and 300 cases for Dr. Krishan Kumar. So uh, this also revolves around uh, that 40%, the finding was that 40% of the cases, again, were uh, suicidal deaths were related to alcohol. So uh, it's also in line with whatever we uh, detect in our forensic labs. Now, sample preparation issues are always there in uh, the Indian context. Uh, FSL Delhi has uh, one of the best techniques, and we are looking for uh, automa uh, automation of our sample preparation techniques. Uh, we are moving with the time and uh, with the philosophy of upgrading ourselves, uh, not complacent with the techniques we are having. So there's room of improvement, and we have taken this crisis uh, uh, really as a stepping stone to upgrade ourselves. So small volume extraction, liquid phase uh, micro extraction, ultrasonic and head space extraction and pulverization. These we are uh, using and uh, we'll move towards super uh, critical fluid extraction and automated solid phase extraction. So in to uh, you know, reduce the carbon uh, footprint and also move towards greener technique where less and less solvent will be used as compared to LLEs. So uh, now we are, it's time to upgradation. As I said, LCMS, uh, my other uh, presenters, uh, our colleagues who had been uh, from Egypt and uh, Turkey had been talking in detail about LCMS and QTOF. So uh, uh, that was an eye opener. And it's uh, very good that those techniques can really address the problem of NPS and uh, other drugs. Uh, Headspace, uh, HC, uh, Headspace GCMS is being used in our laboratory for confirmation of uh, any kind of volatiles apart from quantitation of alcohol. And HPTLC MS is a very good technique from Kamag and Shimadzu hyphenated technique we have uh, in our uh, forensic science laboratory in the uh, chemistry division. And we have, you know, our uh, findings and our research studies have been accepted in a high peer reviewed journal like Journal of Planet Chromatography. We have published our findings over here. So they are very good techniques when it comes to detection of poisons and especially drugs and narcotics. And biochip array technology is again uh, uh, a very uh, new technique which has come down. It can, uh, it's a very clean one, which I have understood with a drop of blood you can really go for the amino acids and uh, it's based on the ELISA. So uh, you can really you know, for, the, for your groups, 
three, five to thirty drugs group screening at one go. So it again reduces the uh, contamination. IR is sufficient enough to uh, distinguish between the stereoisomers. So where we have problem with that, like three MMC and four MMC, so you can really distinguish by using this technique. So it's all about risk management. So complete uh, a quick SWOT analysis about this risk management in the pandemic era, uh, era is laboratory needs to plan for the risk and opportunities. Yes, all laboratories cannot be same. And um, uh, really, uh, it depends, uh, the choice depends upon the laboratory, like how the, uh, they want to address the risk and uh, uh, what opportunities they can find uh, in this uh, challenging uh, period. So uh, can provide impetus to save effort and encourage the development, new techniques and quicker or easier calibrations. Now, what does this mean for us is to identify, assess, evaluate and control and monitor and change, change our attitude and change our, uh, you know, uh, whole point of view towards uh, analysis, but with scientific and logical interpretations. So again, uh, uh, risk assessment as uh, practice in uh, 2016, there has been a guideline and this is an eye opener for us because order number one, we cannot do as forensic toxicologists, but two, three and four can be done. Use of pro uh, personal protective equipment, PPEs have been there. In our laboratory in FSL Delhi also, we are very critical about this and this has been provided to all those attending the crime scene and in the laboratory area also and uh, rigorous sanitization is being done, then engineering controls can be used and we are working on that. Again, substitute and isolate. So uh, when we are going to examine COVID positive cases, uh, we are going to develop this uh, resource, uh, this kind of resource for us also, this kind of facility for ourselves, because uh, that is required we, uh, to prevent contamination and infections. So that is one gray area which has to be addressed and we have taken up the challenge and we are uh, almost on the job. So the precautions, yes, regular health checkup for forensic practitioners and oral uh, chemo prophylaxis at FSL Delhi, we have been doing this in India. Disposal as per Biomedical Waste Act, job rotation, staggered lunch hours, social distancing, all these norms are being uh, followed in spirit. So yes, that comes to the, uh, we have considered every potential risk except the risk of avoiding all risks. This is just on the lighter side. But yes, the risks need to be addressed. And it is also uh, in line with the ISO 17025, where in the clause eight, you have got this opportunity to, to discuss your risks. So Forensic Science Laboratory is committed to uh, deliver highest forensic report to assess criminal justice system. And under the able guidance of our present director, Ms. Deepa Verma, we are moving towards this. It's time for forensic scientists to take this pandemic as a challenge and not to be deterred and turn all risks into opportunity for celebrating life. And that is all we are here for. So thank you very much for the patient hearing and a journey with confidence always. And I regret that uh, in mid, uh, there was some connection issues and all. Namaskar once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kanak, for this extremely exhaustive presentation and covering all the aspects of the forensic toxicology and day-to-day -day practice where we are concerned. First, I will request you to this hand over this your host screen to Alpha Forensic Lab, please. Yes, Alpha Forensic, how, how, how to do this? No. Just go to the participants, participant list, and in there you will find Alpha Forensic Lab. And there is option, you just click the host, it will be transferred. Uh, yeah, ma'am, please uh, first turn off sharing your screen, then do that. Ma'am, uh, please uh, stop sharing the screen. Just cross this. Okay. Stopped. Yeah. Now you can transfer. And then in the participant list, uh, Alpha Lab will be seen. Participants, yes. Participants list. Yes, ma'am. Alpha Lab. Alpha Lab. Go on to the top. Uh, Alpha Lab. 
yes ma'am and then if you click on that there's an option to make host where is alpha lab i'm not able to uh, nirush uh, i'm not able to go on to the top ma'am just Are you getting search me, it on the participant list uh, in the yeah. participant yes. list there's an option just Hello. type participants Ma'am, can you hear me? Uh, Ma'am, if you are not getting alpha lab, then make host to Nirosa, please. To scroll the participants, you will find very easily alpha number alpha one. Alpha lab, I got it. Yeah. No. Just click that. Click that, and you will you will have the option to make a host. Just click that. Nirusha, alpha lab. Ma'am, did you get it? Make host. Yes, ma'am. Make host, na? Nirosha. Yes, host. yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes. Anyone? Okay. Anyone? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nirosha thank is the host now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Kanak, for this extremely exhaustive, you. You, nice elucidation of this forensic toxicology thank practice. especially during the covid times and you have very rightly said there is an always an opportunity in these kind of circumstances so this gives uh, a direction future direction to us also uh, thank you dr kanak please uh, i request all the participants to be there because we'll be taking the question answers in the last as well as all the speakers also to be here till the end i request uh, our next speaker from the other part of the world dr pallavi divedi who is a research instructor in the clinical research division in Texas Tech University of Health and Center El Paso Texas uh, i request in the meantime uh, nirosha to please make dr pallavi dubey as a host yes so yeah. yes it will be done soon dr pallavi uh, she did her phd in forensic toxicology uh, from iit rurki itself uh, and she was a recipient of a scholarship from switzerland so many awards as in her credit she did her msc in forensic sciences from the national institute of criminology and forensic sciences delhi itself and after finishing her phd from iit rurki when she came into contact with me and she and uh, she was a post doctoral fellow under me at the I, aims icmr project but then afterwards uh, she <laughs> she went to usa uh, after getting married and now she is settled there Uh, but then forensic toxicology has been uh, you can say uh, part and parcel of her uh, her life till date although she is currently uh, doing in the, the department of ops and uh, gynae there but then she is again associated in the toxicology in the clinical toxicology more more than a forensic toxicology so i requested her to share the toxicology setup the functioning and if there is any change during this covid pandemic in usa So welcome, Pallavi. It's so good to see you after a long time, and uh, now the day is is yours. Your voice. You please uh, mute, unmute your mic. Unmute. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Doctor Adarsh. Uh, you have been one of the most influential mentors in my life. You have always motivated all of us to uh, just look forward, look ahead, and your vision it has actually inspired us to do many things. So, 
thank you so much and um, thank you for giving me an opportunity to come and talk here so currently um, i work as a research instructor into the department of um, obstetrics and gynecology into paul l foster school of medicine um texas tech university health science center el paso uh, this is west texas and our current feature is um clinical research but uh, my primary interest is into toxicology and pharmacology um pharmaceuticals so this is uh, what i have been working into currently so we do analyze the uh, environmental toxins uh, environmental toxicants primarily into the predominant hispanic population over here so one of my um, current projects is looking into the endocrine disruptors which are um, phthalates heavy metals um, pesticides mostly in us profiles we do not do not find a lot of pesticides but yes the phthalates parabens um your um, triclosan uh, these are the common toxicants which we found which we found here so we actually designed a study in which we were looking at the endocrine disruptors especially in the hispanic population suffering from various um, disorders like you might have heard of the polycystic ovarian ovarian syndrome so polycystic ovarian syndrome is something in which you get hyperandrogenism and hyperandrogenism is directly linked to um, the higher concentration of phthalates to higher concentration of triclosan and bisphenol so currently when we talk about um, a lot of uh, toxicological or global research going on it's going towards the environmental toxicants because that directly affects us so that's the major part of my work right now but since the focus here is about the covid-19 uh, pandemic so i would like to share one of my uh, recent works which has been published in the european journal of uh, obgyn um which is about the treatment profile of uh, the covid-19 infected women so i just generally want to say because most of you have been dealing with the pharmaceuticals have been dealing with the drugs have been dealing with the um post mortem autopsies um of a lot of covid-19 infected people so there is a certain group uh, which is the pregnant women and neonatal group which is not studied well whether they are clinical trials whether they are um autopsies whether they are you know what happens what is the condition of the placenta after uh, the death so i am here to talk on all those aspects um it's not i do not um certainly uh, narrowly very uh, much talk about the forensic toxicology but i understand that pharmacology is an important part of the toxicology so we do um learn about the trends of uh, the treatment profiles which have been going on around the world and um i would also like to talk about how a particular studies which have been published are regarding the covid-19 pandemic the treatment profiles or the outcomes have been um doing a bias in our mind so um allow me to share my screen uh so that i could just start my presentation just click on share my screen you are host okay yeah okay sir first you uh open your ppt on the screen first yes. minimize it yes. and then yeah now now it is started coming yeah is there okay. yeah now you can just put the the slide show okay sir to have the full screen okay sir so i would like to talk about the maternal and neonatal characteristics and outcomes among covid 19 infected women so i would certainly talk about the adverse outcomes because being forensic toxicologists or um 
forensic medicine experts, we always talk about the adverse outcomes. So um, I would like to tell you what we did in our previous papers. So we looked at PubMed and we looked at um, COVID-19 and pregnancy, COVID-19 pregnancy and adverse outcomes, COVID-19 neonatal characteristics, COVID-19 neonatal adverse outcomes. And we looked upon 459 uh, articles, case reports, case series, cohort studies, which had been published. So we looked at around 429 articles, uh, which were identified at, as old texts. And then we uh, removed 401 articles after uh, screening and removing the duplicates. 265 articles we excluded because they were either systematic or narrative reviews, or they were animal studies or clinical trials, um, other things. So finally, we included 34 studies in our study as a case series and 27 studies were included as case reports. So I don't think this is an open forum, but I like to ask my students, like what is the difference between case studies and case reports? And while doing a systematic review, why don't you include both of them together? So the answer to this is that case reports are generally about something which is very unique. So it always affects the number of adverse outcomes you are looking for. So that's uh, one of the things why we do the case series and the case reports uh, differently uh, when we are doing a literature survey. So when we looked at the adverse outcomes, um, I know my screen is uh, blurred a little bit, but if you could see that uh, when we looked at the adverse pregnancy outcomes, the overall um, pregnancy outcomes uh, were divided into China, USA, and Europe. And China had overall the most amount of pregnancy adverse outcomes, which was like around 25%, as opposed to USA, which was 5%, and Europe was 6%. Um, so when we talk about adverse pregnancy events, it could lead to anything from um, your cesarean section, your maternal death, termination of pregnancy, termination of um, abortion, miscarriage, um, maternal death, severity of COVID-19 leading to ICU admissions and death. So this is what we looked at. And we looked at that uh, China had overall a very high amount of adverse outcomes as compared to the other parts of the world. So now quickly jumping on to the treatment profiles. Um, I understand that treatment profiles are important to understand for uh, the classification of the toxicological profiles of the patients. For example, a pregnant, uh, there was a very devastating case in Iran where um, nine uh, women were admitted to the hospital and seven of them died. And um, upon doing the histopathological um, autopsy of the mothers and the neonates, there was uh, an indication of the vertical transmission of COVID-19. So, um, and then further on, when we looked at their treatment profile, we looked that they were given intensive treatments, but the severity of the disease did not uh, deter, it did not fade away. The woman died and most of the uh, neonates and the fetus, they also died. So here it's very important to understand the treatment profiles in COVID-19, like what is the trend? How is it going? Because since we are talking global here, there are a lot of scientists from a lot of parts of the world. So I actually made a, a summary of how the treatment profile differs around the world and how it affects us. So the uh, rate of oxygen support is highest in Asia, which is like 93%, which, is start, which was started in early March. Um, in USA, late April, it was 18%. And in Europe, it was 26%. So we see like we as Asians are using more treatment profile, um, we're using more treatments as compared to uh, USA and Europe. So this is the um, oxygen support. When we look at the steroids, Asia is not using any steroids as compared to USA and Europe. Um, Asia is at 12% while USA is at 3% and Europe is at 16%. So 
in later on also later profiles also we'll we'll see that europe is actually using more pharmaceuticals as compared to um asia and uh europe uh when we talk at the immunosuppressants which have been the talk of the town till now and interestingly a lot of deaths maternal deaths which have happened in to the pregnant woman by covid-19 immunosuppressants was not given as a treatment option in there and later on when we did the autopsies and when we did the toxicological profiles of those women just just interestingly a lot of studies pointed out towards the lack of immunosuppressants into the treatment profiles so you could see uh, why is that because uh, in asia immunosuppressants were not given at all versus usa and europe it was only 3% and 4% so the trend is now picking up but it was very less then there have been a lot of buzz about hydroxychloroquine how hydroxychloroquine is a treatment and is not a treatment so surprisingly hydroxychloroquine is a common drug for malaria into uh, the asian subcontinent but the distribution was only uh, between 3% to 6% all all through the pandemic in asia versus in usa it was a bit higher 9% which i was not expecting and europe was always very high so europeans always believed into the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine and um, if you could see almost 25% to 45% was the distribution so almost in 25 to 45% of the studies hydroxychloroquine was one of the uh, major drugs which were administered so when we talk about the buzz about hydroxychloroquine um, asia and usa are much behind rather than europe um so antivirals um asia have been doping the antivirals a lot as compared to usa and europe so usa i don't know they just don't believe into any treatments in covid-19 right now so usa is at 3% 2% to 3% as compared to asia which is doing a lot of antiviral treatment from 73% to 46 54% over the period of time so the left column here is um when we started in early uh, february or early march and then to early july what is the trend so you could look at the table and you could actually look at the trend of the treatment uh then you look at the anticoagulants um same way europe started off with a great deal of anticoagulants which is heparin but now the trend is decreasing so i would say we have gotten a lot smarter over the time period to see what drugs actually will affect the covid-19 rather than just dumping the patients with uh, all kind of uh, drug profiles these are the miscellaneous drugs and antibiotics i would like to talk about it because asia in late february they started with like 100% of the patients were given antibiotics so everybody who was walking in with a positive covid-19 infection was given antibiotics and this later dropped down to 72% while usa they started with 24% and they came down to 13% and europe started with 35% and now they are back to 13% so antibiotics they were being given to everybody in the beginning to manage the covid-19 uh, pandemic but um, now the ratio has decreased it has come down to mostly self isolation and other uh, way of works plasma therapy we have been working on the plasma therapy a lot and we do see what is um, the effect of plasma therapy on the icu patients or the patients which actually um, uh, meet maternal death or there is a severity of symptoms and what is the effect of plasma therapy on this so this is particularly interesting because uh, plasma therapy has just entered the scenario and as again asia is again using the uh, plasma therapy a lot for now so when we look at the maternal admissions um here we talk about the icu admissions because most of the icu admissions have led to mechanical ventilations and deaths so in asia uh, surprisingly the number has been like really low as compared to europe which was from 18% has come down to 9% so i would say 
for the pandemic, for the pregnant patients in terms of ICU admissions and deaths, we are doing better than before. And this is because of better um, management. So uh, the number of ICU admissions have decreased. And then if we look for the death, the number of deaths um, have increased over the period of time because uh, previously there was it was said that the pregnant patients and the neonates are uh, they are not differently affected. But when we looked at the placental analysis, when we did the histopathology, uh, when we did uh, the blood work, we saw that pregnant women were at increased risk for COVID-19. So I'll I'll present some. Uh, histology slides later on so that you could see like what is the rate of macrophages um, into the uh, pregnant patients placentas. So this is the trend of death and we actually did a meta-analysis in which uh, we looked at um, the rate of um, oxygen support, steroids, immunosuppressants, hydroxychloroquine, antivirals, um, zinc, magnesium, uh, mechanical ventilation, anticoagulants, antibiotics, and plasma anti-liver damage. And uh, when we looked at it, um, we saw, one second. We saw that Europe always had a positive P-value uh, with reference uh, and Asia was taken as a reference because um, most of the treatments were taken uh, in little amount in Asia as compared to the other uh, places. So uh, we again looked at uh, Europe where um, this was always significant. So the number of adverse outcomes were more in Europe as compared to uh, USA and Asia. Um, similarly, uh, the use of anticoagulants and why is that so the anticoagulants have been uh, used. Um, uh, so this was also significant as compared to the adverse outcomes, the maternal deaths and uh, the other kind of adverse uh, outcomes. Um, so when we looked at uh, the preterm birth, Europe had always a more devastating outcome. Um, so the p-value is significant here. And then the zinc and magnesium and miscellaneous, why? Because zinc and magnesium is anyways given for um, maturation of lungs during the preterm birth. So any kind of neonatal deaths which we have encountered till now um, are actually directly related to uh, any preterm births which we have gotten here. So this is uh, the placental findings, uh, which we are seeing here. So uh, these are the villies and the decidua, which are predominantly consistent, uh, consistent over here. So you could see like in the CD163, you could see like there is a presence of a lot amount of macrophages um, for CD8. Uh, uh, there are macrophages, but if you look for the CD4s, you could see that there are a lot of CD4 positive T lymphocytes in the villi. So these uh, placental findings actually indicate that um, although the incidence of vertical transmission is very, very low, the COVID-19 um, could go to the placenta and it could actually affect the fetus in the, in the placenta. So when we looked at the CD4 positive T lymphocytes in the decidua, we look at that how the placenta has been infected. So when they say that uh, there is no sign of a vertical transmission, that's actually not true. So um, these are my findings uh, currently. And uh, that's it. This is just part of my presentation. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pallavi for exposing us or giving this idea of this, you can say the toxicity on the female gen female uh, reproductive system and all. I think uh, that relatively that area is relatively alien to us. We have never thought of those kind of aspects in our country because we are just getting, you can say, managing the toxicology cases routinely and conducting the postmortem. But that's very good that you have just brought out this entirely uh, different aspect of the toxicology on the female reproductive uh, systems. There are a few questions also for you from certain uh, uh, the participants, but all the questions I will take in the last. 
So thank you, Pallavi. Please be there. Uh, yes. All the questions I'll be taking in the last. Uh, now I take this opportunity to invite our last speaker. And as we say that uh, we save the best for the last before inviting my dear friend, Dr. Peter from UK, I request uh, Pallavi to please give this uh, host position to either to Alpha Forensic Lab or uh, Nirosha. Okay, uh, how do I do that, sir? So Ma'am, just... uh, you can go to the participants uh, there and then uh, you can see either Alpha Lab or uh, Nirosha. So uh, if you click on one of those, you'll have the option to make host. Okay, uh, do I type in ALPHA Alpha? No, ALFA Alpha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you click there in the more option, you will see make host, and then you. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. No problem. Now I request Nirosha to make Peter as a host. Yeah. Yes, as you done, sir. Yeah. So, uh, Peter is a very good friend of mine. In fact, I met Peter uh, nine years ago when I was there in common uh, in Dundee, in my stint as a Commonwealth fellow. And from there on, we are in constant touch. I find him as a very enthusiastic and uh, you can say very great forensic toxicologist. What I, I could learn so many things from two of my good friends uh, from Scotland. Dr. Peter is there, here, of course, as a speaker. And another friend, Dr. Nitin, also I am, I am seeing he is in the participant list waiting for asking for so many questions. Uh, I request him uh, to be there till, till the end. So Peter is currently working as a senior forensic toxicologist within the forensic medicine science department of the University of Glasgow, Scotland. So currently he is in Scotland, uh, Glasgow, not in Dundee. And his institution, this Glasgow, this Department of Forensic Sciences, is the large, longest established academic forensic institutions in the UK. In fact, it was established in 1839. And this center is, is responsible for almost 90% of the post-mortem toxicology work in all over the Scotland. I think it caters to everywhere, only 10% near the Edinburgh region that goes only to that. Otherwise, the everywhere, it is just going to the uh, their lab itself. He is a fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry. He is a founder member of UK Association of Forensic Toxicology. He is on the editorial advisory board of internationally renowned, what we, what we consider as a Bible of toxicology, that is the Clark's analysis of drugs. Uh, and uh, poisons. So he's on the editorial advisory board of that book. And his research focus, of course, is on postmortem redistribution and this uncertainty of the blood alcohol cal calculations and the new psychoactive substances, uh, NPS, particularly designer benzodiazepines. So I take this opportunity to, to share his views and how this forensic toxicology system works in UK, which is considered to be the one of the best I can see because I have worked there. So I, I just request Peter to just share. And if, if there is some change in the practice during this COVID-19 pandemic, if there is a, some something, uh, you can say some special changes are there, as I think you must have observed during Dr. Kanak's uh, presentation, that in India, of course, we have got uh, certain changes in our uh, forensic toxicology functioning. So with this, I invite Dr. Peter to take the dais. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, but then... Excellent. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll give a bit of an overview of forensic... No. I think before that, Nirosha, please make him host because I'm not seeing. Still, it is uh, viewing only the Pallavi's screen. No, it has not been transferred. Uh, actually, he's made the host, uh, but I don't know what's wrong. Yeah, now, uh, sir, you're the host, uh, Peter, sir. Can you see it, my screen now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, now I can see. Excellent. So, what I'm going to do is give a bit of an overview um, about forensic toxicology in the UK and then towards the end give some of the changes that we've had to make in terms of 
the laboratory for COVID-19 at this level. But first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kumar for inviting me to this really esteemed meeting. It was really pleased to be invited and I've, it's been a really enjoyable meeting and a series of presentations that we've had. And I, I've actually learned a lot about what's going on around the world. So most of you know where the UK is, but then I'll assume that you don't. And we've got a population at the moment of about 66 million. And in terms of that, most of it, as you can see, is down in England and Wales. Scotland, you're looking at about 6 million. And the UK becomes odd because although it's a series of countries, the way the law actually works in certain places can differ. So Scotland has a separate legal system compared to England and Wales. This historically came about when there was a merger of the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of Scotland, and Scotland were allowed to keep their own legal system. And for that reason, there are significant differences between the way things are done between England um, and Scotland. When I say England, I mean England and Wales because legally they're pretty much the same entity. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to ignore Northern Ireland because they, again, have a slightly different legal system to England and Wales and Scotland there. So looking at it initially, when we're looking at forensic services, England about 15, 20 years ago, went down a path that pretty much no one else in the world has gone down. They decided that what they were going to do was contract out their forensic services. So there, there was various private companies that were established and the government started allowing them to bid for forensics work. So in terms of England, now private companies are the ones that do the majority of the forensic service. There are some forensic services carried out by the police. And when we're looking at forensic toxicology, toxicology is carried out by some hospital units, some forensic science, private forensic science providers. And it really depends on what sort of area you are and how that ties in. In Scotland, all of the forensic services have really remained in public sector. So the forensic services, what you have is 99% of the forensics work, pretty much everything apart from forensic toxicology is done by an independent forensic service, the Scottish Police Authority. They are, although they've got the police in the word, they are independent from the police. The toxicology services are then carried out in universities around Scotland. Now, one of the odd things about Scotland, and this then sort of ties in when we're talking about the law later on, Scotland, you need to have corroboration. So as I've got written here, evidence of a single witness, however credible, is not sufficient to prove a charge against an accused or to establish any material or crucial fact. So what we're saying here is if we have an accused and that accused confesses to a crime, that confession is not enough. There needs to be another piece of evidence for an individual to be able to be charged. And when we're then looking at forensic work, it means that in terms of criminal cases or cases that are going to go to court, we actually need to have two individuals looking at something rather than one. And you'll see how that comes in a little later. So the death investigation, because of the two separate legal systems in England and Wales is different to ones in Scotland. So in England and Wales, effectively, there's a coronial investigative system. And the job of the coroner there is to basically identify the specific issue of how the deceased came by their death. They're not interested in prosecuting anyone for that death. They will just give a verdict 
such that it would be uh, suicide, death by misadventure, um, unlawful killing, etc. But that would then not necessarily lead to a prosecution. So what usually happens in England is that any criminal investigation will be completed before the coronial system will occur. Now that coronial investigation is a court in its own right and people can attend that court and see the coronial inquests that are going on. In Scotland, what is carried out is basically an investigation by the procurator fiscal, a public prosecutor. And that public prosecutor's job, as we've got here, is to investigate any death which requires further explanation. So if really when we're looking at this, a medical practitioner will not sign off a death certificate because they don't know what the cause of death or they think there's something criminal, Peter, that will be referred to the procurator Peter, fiscal. Who sorry, then, Peter. Yes. Sorry, can I intervene? Uh, probably you have missed the, your screen share because your PPT are not coming on this screen. Ah. Uh, sorry to intervene, but... It says, I, what about... Uh, now. Are we good now? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. yes Excellent. Yes. No. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. The only interesting bit you've met is Scotland's up here, England's down here. <laughs> um, apologies. So, in terms of the procurator fiscal is then overseeing everything, and if they think that there is actually something to prosecute, at that point in time, then they can move down that route. There isn't a public inquiry or a public investigation unless there's some specific circumstances, such as a death in police custody or in prison, a death at work in which they think there is something that they can investigate further, or if there is something where what they want to do is there's public interest in the case. So there's fewer public inquiries for looking at things compared to England. So in terms of how they work, coroners in England have around 200,000 deaths. Fifth, about 50% of them, they need post-mortem examinations ordered by the coroner. So unlike some legal jurisdictions where every unexplained death has to have an autopsy, it's up to the coroner to decide whether there's going to be an autopsy at that point in time. They must be carried out by effectively a state registered forensic pathologist. Um, the coroner can pick whichever pathologist they want to investigate that crime. Any of the coroners then it's up to the coroner to basically subcontract, say, toxicology services. So this is why you have a lot of forensic service providers. And for example, you could have a lab way in the north of England actually doing investigations for somewhere, say, down in the south of England. There is a move in certain areas, mainly in sort of the Midlands, of England around here to actually look at non-invasive, so CT scanning autopsies. Now this has not taken off extensively, but started to, to be pushed. In terms of toxicology, we're looking around 20,000 in England and Wales. So in Scotland, what they, although the procurator fiscal oversees everything, a few years ago, they decided that they couldn't really have the public prosecutors doing everything. They wanted to try and focus them a bit more. So they set up Scottish Fatalities Investigation Units. So they are part of the Procurator Fiscal Service, but they deal with areas. So you can see we've got three areas, the North, the East and the West. Now, in terms of population of Scotland, basically everyone lives in the East and the West. When you're looking at a population of about 6 million, about 5 million live in the East and the West with 1 million living in the green area that we've got. 
we have three, uh, sorry, four major pathology centers, one in Aberdeen, one in Dundee, um, one in Edinburgh and one in Glasgow. With forensic toxicology now, basically the main is in Glasgow and then there's a minor center up in Aberdeen um, in the north. So we divided up like that. Still all of the pathology centers and the pathologists are, are linked to universities at the moment. In England, most of the forensic pathologists are just in private practice. So they are registered pathologists, but they are not linked to universities. So in Scotland, because it's smaller, you get around 10,000 deaths support reported to the Procurator Fiscal each year. Around 50% of those are autopsied and around 90% of those autopsies require toxicology. So this is where we go back into the slight system of corroboration. So you can see we've got three different sorts of autopsies here, a two doctor, a one doctor, and a view and grant. So the two doctor ones are two pathologists are present for the autopsy, and they will write a joint report with the findings that they've then agreed. That then means there is corroboration for whatever finding they have. If there is, um, say it's a homicide, they would still ha then have an, an independent defense pathologist come in to do the post-mortem. So there's still then effectively a third person, but you need those two pieces of evidence to prosecute. That then means for toxicology in those cases, two toxicologists have to look at all of the case material and write a joint report agreeing on their findings. So we then have two independent sources that we've got. The one doctor are when they think there is not likely to be an investigation or any criminal proceedings following that investigation. They can at any time turn it into a two doctor if they think there's a problem. Again, with that one for toxicology, you would only then need one toxicology right, one toxicologist writing a report. The final one, um, which is sort of an oddity for Scotland, is known as the view and grant, where the body is taken for post mortem, but a post mortem is not usually carried out. What the pathologist will do is look at the body and say we don't think there's any reason or any need to open up the body. This may be one that they only want to look at toxicology, so they will take toxicological samples, say the femoral vein, urine and vitreous, send that for toxicological analysis, but they won't then open up the body or do any more um, post-mortems. So that's an option that they have in terms of that, and that would be classed as a one doctor toxicology report so there's you can see how the differences occur in terms of the English and the the Scottish system because of the legal different legal jurisdictions everyone else has talked a lot about samples and about the various pieces of kit and we all know what's going on there in terms of the analysis the laboratory would carry out they would be usually dependent on the instructions of the pathologist or the procurator fiscal in terms of Scotland. Again, the procurator fiscal is the ultimate authority. They are the ones that are deciding whether a post-mortem should happen, whether it's a one doctor, two doctor view and grant, what toxicology should be happening. They usually defer to the pathologist, but sometimes they will ask for specific um, information. The analysis will depend on the analyte that we're actually looking at. And I was really interested to see the breakdown of the drugs that we had in various other countries around the world, because Scotland is very, very traditional in the drugs that it likes to take. Scotland, alcohol, the top drug that is seen in a significant number of cases. As you're probably well aware, Scotland is probably the country with the largest number of drugs deaths around the world. And we have big problems in terms of heroin and morphine there. 
all of the heroin addicts seem to like taking benzodiazepines. The one that we're seeing the most of is etizolam. Now, this becomes very different to England, who don't have as many heroin deaths and don't see as many benzodiazepines as Scotland sees. There's been a move recently for your drug addicts, heroin addicts, to start be taking cocaine on top of their heroin. And then they're also taking pregabalin stroke gabapentin, which we started to see coming in in about 2011, 2012. But pretty much every single drug related death, we're actually seeing pregabalin gabapentin. Now, I know there's significant concern around the world in terms of this new psychoactive substances, but really in terms of what we're seeing in Scotland now, you're not seeing them apart from effectively your designer benzodiazepines. And again, this spice synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists only seen in the prison population in Scotland. We're not seeing it in the wider general population, which you're, see, you're tending to see in England and Wales. So although we have a wider variety and we have seen some of these designer drugs, pretty much people are sticking to, to what they've always stuck to in Scotland. They are sort of a very traditional country in terms of that. Now, it was very interesting earlier to see the number of pesticides and sort of metals that were seen. And I'll go back to the other slide. Um, in a minute. Rarely see insecticides and pesticides. I mean, I think in my toxicology career, I've probably reported three or four insecticide pesticide cases. You just don't see it. People don't take them um, in the UK. We don't see these metallic poisons as well. We did see a lot of lighter fluid, hairspray, glue abuse, mainly in the 1980s and the 1990s, but that's really dropped off as well. So it's really interesting to see the differences in different countries and the drug abuse and the poisons that people are taking around the world. Some of the things that we have seen recently in terms of suicides is people are starting to use helium in terms of suicidal methods and one that's coming in the last year or so sodium nitrate which reduces the amount of oxygen that can bind to hemoglobin and this has caused us some particular problems in terms of detection because you can look at meth hemoglobinemia uh, met hemoglobin but met hemoglobin changes in terms of the post-mortem so just by taking a blood sample exposing it to air you can get met hemoglobin arriving. We can look at nitrates and nitrites, but it's something that, because it's not traditionally been seen, we're not set up as much. So we'll then have to be sent to a specialist lab for absolute confirmation rather than be, being um, routine work in the UK. So it gives you a flavour of the sort of things that are being seen, certainly in Scotland, and helium and the sodium nitrate really are being seen across the UK. Now, we were asked to sort of talk about COVID. So I've focused down in terms of COVID for what we're doing in the, the lab and the changes that we've had to make. So we've not really seen any difference in terms of the type of cases that we're getting in or the drug abuse that we're getting in with COVID. Certainly people in Scotland are still taking the drugs that they always took and we're getting a similar sort of death profile than we were before COVID. So we've not seen any changes in that, but certainly in terms of the drug analysis that we've been doing in the laboratory setup have changed significantly. We haven't changed the way we're handling samples because we've always treated those as being potentially infectious with serious infections, HIV, hepatitis, etc. So we haven't changed that because we've always been using sample handling that was above and beyond what was needed and keeping people away and keeping them in um, microbiological fume cupboards. What we have brought in is strict social distancing and decontamination. So anytime anyone enters the building, they have to use hand gel. There's 
a lot more increases in terms of hand washing and decontaminating things like computers. So every single person has been given an individual computer where possible to do their reporting. They're in their own offices. People are not allowed in their office unless um, they're invited in. So there's been a, a stop in terms of that. Desks have to be decontaminated at the beginning and at the end of every day. Any socializing space in the department has been shut. So anyone now needs to eat their lunch at their desk. So people are being kept apart from each other. As part of our ISO 17025, every single transfer step needs to be witnessed. So if we're taking a blood sample out of a tube for analysis, that needs to be witnessed by someone else. So we've moved to video witnessing where everything is filmed and that film can then be uh, watched by someone else to sign to say there's been transfer. So all of this is to try and make sure that people are not getting in contact with each other. All people are being given video cameras for their computers and now any departmental meetings we have are via Teams or Zoom to make sure that we're not interacting with people. And the final thing that we've done is actually putting slots in for work because each room is only allowed a certain number of people in at a certain time. So each person gets a slot and a space that they're allowed to use at that point in time to again limit people and the contact that people are actually having at that point in time. This means that throughout the day, people very rarely need to get close to anyone else um, in the department. If anyone that needs to get close to anyone, then additional PPE is brought in. But this happens very, very rarely. And so all of this has meant that we can actually keep up and maintain the service we were maintaining before, but with the added um, COVID-19 precautions to try and make everyone safer in terms of how we're working. So it's definitely been a big change. I think in terms of socializing, you interact with a lot fewer people than you did before because you're doing everything sort of over computer and via Teams, Zoom, etc. So that was a bit of a flavor of what goes on in England and you can see and, and Wales and the UK and it's odd that for one country there is actually differences in terms of what we're looking at and how we um, look at it and what's going on and a, a little flavor of what we've done in terms of the lab to try and stop any COVID transmission, but still maintain the service we're providing for the forensic environment. And I'd like to thank um, Dr. Kumar, Professor Kumar for inviting me to this, uh, to this prestigious meeting. And if anyone's got any questions, then feel free to ask me. Thank you, Peter, uh, for a very exhaustive and extremely valuable presentations. And thanks for accepting my request to be the speaker. I know it has been a very hectic day for you because yes. <laughs> in the morning you had to drop to your daughter for university session. And, uh, yes. <laughs> but ultimately <laughs> you could make it. And because of that, I have to choose time frame accordingly so that yeah. even uh, in the last, if you can join. So otherwise also, as we say that probably we have saved the best for the last so I think you very well uh, explained the system of uh, this functioning over this uh, Scotland. And I think uh, so many participants are interested to learn more about your uh, setup and all. Well, uh, uh, thanks to all the speakers uh, over here from the different parts of the world. And uh, I'll be asking the so many questions from various participants on different forums, not only on this Zoom, but then Facebook and everywhere. So I have compiled few of them. Uh, if there is some specific particular question, I will give it to her or him only. Well, there is a specific question from Dr. Nitin Sitohal from Nottingham, England itself. And he wants to ask something about uh, QTQF. So since you are here, I think Nitin, I will invite you to ask directly. Please uh, unmute your mic and uh, 
uh, because the the speaker is also here, so she can directly answer your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Kumar, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to to hear all the speakers today. So my question, uh, actually, I've had a, a reply already, but it would be good for others to know about it as well. Uh, it's about the Q, uh, Qtop, uh, Qtop uh, instrument. I have uh, quite, uh, I've used Qtop for quite a while now, and I've been using Walter's system. And I've seen there is a lot of variability up to over 5 ppm at times when uh, lock mass is not used uh, with QTOF for water system. But I would like to uh, ask uh, the uh, speaker uh, to probably give a bit more information on the SIEX setup and what Did you ask? I couldn't are. hear you, but I read before. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. OK. In QTOF, there is a calibration solutions. Every hour, uh, they do calibration itself. There are some uh, specific um, substance inside it. Uh, we don't know what are they, uh, but one of them is uh, resarpinino. And it calibrates itself every hour. So we don't need any lock mass. Okay. All we right. Okay. Thanks. So okay. It, it, it does. It, does it do an auto calibration then? What? Does it do auto. an auto calibration? Auto calibration. Does Does your system does an auto calibration? Yes. Yes. Auto calibration. Yes. We don't need Thank to you. inject anything. We don't need to inject uh, anything to the sample. It does itself. All right, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nitin. Uh, the next question is from uh, uh, Dr. Suman from uh, Bangladesh, Chittagong. And uh, he or she, uh, I can't make it out because this name may be of both genders. He, uh, she has asked about the, what is the commonest poisoning in post-mortem cases from the country of Egypt? So that is specific question is to Dr. Noha. Could I uh, attention you? Oh, you, you are here? Yeah. Hello? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I am so from uh, someone is asking. Okay, okay. You can answer. So are you asking a question? You, you can, yeah, but please, you can, you can ask the question again if you would like to. I don't know. Which poison is common among the postmodern poisoning cases in your country? Okay, so um, actually, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, it differs according to the uh, uh, the geographical distribution or according to the part of the country. So if you, uh, for example, take Upper Egypt is going to be different from lower, lower Egypt and it's different according to the year uh, uh, on which the reports are connected. But generally during the, let's say, the past uh, maybe uh, four or five years, the organophosphorus intoxication has been topping the list of deaths among all age groups in the uh, in Egypt. So most probably this is the uh, most common uh, cause of the post-mortem uh, uh, cases or the death from poisoning. Uh, it differs also according to the age groups, but organophosphorus generally is usually the most common, uh, plus some other uh, drugs, but it's usually the most common. I think uh, the same situation is here in India and maybe the, in Bangladesh also, where the agricultural countries are there. I think we are getting the maximum number of poisoning cases out of uh, this agricultural poisoning, pesticide poisoning. Contrary to what Peter has shared, that in his whole life, when he has conducted uh, more than 2,500 analysis, but hardly four or five cases of pesticide poisoning. Most of the times in UK and all US and other countries, it's more most of the time the drugs and alcohol. Of course, alcohol is is you can say uh, everywhere, but when you talk about the specific poisoning, then organophosphorus poisoning in this part of the world, I think that leads the table uh, amongst the poisoning deaths. Thank you, Noha. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. So then yes, the, I was. If you may allow. Me. Yes, please. Yes, because I was um, really, um, I, I wanted to really emphasize about the what uh, Professor Muskell was just saying. So when he said I only during his years of practice, 
practice, he only found out that there are four or five cases of pesticide poisoning. It's like I, I, I can, I can imagine that I can even see maybe four or five cases of pesticide poisoning maybe in twelve hours or something in my shift. So it's uh, the different numbers are very uh, variant and diverse from one country to another. So this yeah. is to echo what you were just saying. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, then this is the uh, general question from all the speakers. Uh, somebody has asked about what is analytical and regulatory toxicology. What is analytical toxicology? I think that uh, uh, analytical and regulatory toxicity. If uh, any of the speakers can touch upon that. Analytical and regulatory toxicity. Well, I'll give it a go. So, yeah. I suppose analytic, from my point of view, analytical toxicology would be looking at toxicology, well, just basically analyzing toxicological analytes, whereas regulatory would be setting limits of exposure for that people can come into contact with. So, more of sort of workplace and environmental toxicology. Okay, next question is also you for Peter. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Bina has asked, what are the techniques which can be qualitatively used for analysis of the molecules? In terms of what we're um, looking at, we're, the majority of the quantitation that we do is liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, in terms of yeah, quantitative analysis unless obviously you're using alcohol, which is the good old Headspace GC, Ale. what everyone uses. I have one. Yeah, uh, I, I think the same question uh, I like to ask from Dr. Kanak also, because since the question is from India, and I think uh, so many times we have uh, faced the problem about the non-availability of the quantitative analysis other than the alcohol. So maybe Dr. Kanak will like to enlighten all of us. Dr. Kanak Lata Varma, is she there? Dr. Kanak, please. Yeah, I think she is. Yeah. yeah uh, yes. Uh, can I come back? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you are there. The question. Uh, what are the, what are the techniques which can be qualitatively used for the analysis of the molecules? And talking about India, Peter has shared about the. Uh, the the UK setup, especially they are using about the LCS, LCMS and all. But what is the situation in India? Because we are we have faced this problem of non-availability of quantitative analysis, especially in the drug analysis. Then it becomes very much problematic because we don't have other than the ethyl alcohol. So can you enlighten us? The yeah yeah sure uh, for quantitative analysis. Uh, we can use the techniques, uh, the chromatographic techniques, GCMS and uh, HPLC. So, uh, but yes, uh, there is a need of uh, the uh, standard reference material to be there and uh, the targeted drugs or the pesticide. Uh, hello, the targeted ah. drugs or pesticides, whatever is in question, that can be definitely quantitatively analyzed over the uh, cleaner matrix like blood. And yes, uh, by using these uh, hyphenated techniques also, so quantitation can be uh, carried out really. Uh, I mean, that's not a problem. But yes, uh, standard reference material and the calibration needs uh, to be taken care of. Right. And so, uh, we are in India, we are doing uh, Dr. Adash, I have a question. In my slides, uh, the quantitation of alcohol. Please, let, let me finish the questions which are already there then, uh, if the time permits, then I'll allow. Uh, the next question is again from uh, you to Dr. Uh, Kanak. Uh, Dr. Praveen, are you there? Would you like to ask the question? Or should I read your question? Dr. Praveen Singh, are you there? Okay, he has asked about the, uh, what are the chances of infection of spread of COVID uh, from the biological fluids from the dead body? And that question he has asked, he has asked specifically to you. It's a really a million dollar question in the pandemic uh, era. But the thing is like, um, it's really hidden and uh, unknown. 
but yes there can be transmission through formites formation as per the recent studies which are, which has been published formites can really be transmitted and cause risk to those who are working in the laboratory setup but the transmission of virus from the dead to the uh, living uh, around there and as far as all the information shared in the public domain is like uh, it's uh, aerosol transfer uh, transference you know to the respiratory this thing um, but yes formite transmission cannot be ruled out as far as my knowledge goes yeah very rightly uh, i think i will add upon i'd like to add upon here because uh, i didn't find any research which says that this uh, virus can be transmitted from the dead body yeah there was some uh, letter to a editor in published in some journal but then that was uh, ret retracted afterwards and as as far as we know but then we must take the precautions because while conducting the autopsy while opening the cavities some aerosol may be generated so hypothetically it can be transmitted so that's why there are precautions which must be taken when it is there and that gives rise to another question which has been asked by some forensic biologist he has asked what are the precautions to be taken while handling biological fluid during this uh, pandemic uh, any of the speakers uh, maybe dr kanak itself uh, yeah the precautions are general uh, precautions uh, that use of the ppe kits and the deep uh, decontamination of the opening case opening area after every case has been opened and uh, you know uh, good circulation of air in the area where you are opening the case use of biosafety cabinets so these are the general precautions you know bsl2 or bsl3 labs uh, follow but yes if it's not possible to have bsl3 lab facility then in the bsl2 lab also you can use the precautions uh, of those of uh, the uh, you know the resources of bsl3 like using good respiratory masks uh, maintaining uh, you know uh, minimum social distancing like uh, two or three of the scientists can go and uh, on rotation they can open the cases and handling of fluids and all uh, ppe kits are mandatory and uh, after every cases decontamination and sanitization of the area so these are uh, the options i mean these yeah. are the only options yeah true i think uh, peter also has covered on this maybe you like to add upon further peter yes i mean we've we've not changed any of the handling procedures because everything anytime we open any samples they have to be opened in a fume covered um, microbiological cabinet You've got to have gloves your standard laboratory ppe in terms of that we haven't added any additional ppe for covid because we make sure that only people certain people are in certain areas and they maintain distance if people have to get close together then they will have to wear masks but the only time people were generally getting close together was for witnessing sample transfer and because we've moved over to using cameras that is not happening now so people are can generally spend most of their time more than 2 meters away from each other there. yeah yeah social physical distancing as we say uh, okay uh, noha can, can, uh, do you want to add anything upon what is the practice in your setup anything in this context while handling the biological fluids for that matter no actually it uh, as uh, 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 my dear colleagues here just mentioned it's the same uh, we just used some extra precautions uh, using all ppe because uh, while handling the biological fluids we uh, during the burial we try to keep the bodies uh, in a distance that is uh, far from the surface than the normal barrier of the other bodies uh, but there were no actually uh, other uh, uh, specific precautions while uh, dealing with the uh, with the COVID-19 uh, death cases. Uh, maybe in the hospital before we just take them, we always um, uh, try our best. As you mentioned, the, uh, uh, the transfer of COVID from a dead body is not very well documented, but we have to be very careful while doing this. So we tell the people who even uh, wash the body or, um, or do anything that is related to them, or even the relatives when they just want to have a, a final look on their um, uh, beloved ones before uh, uh, taking them to the grave or something. So we just make sure that people are maintaining uh, the distancing, wearing their masks and wearing the PPE, but we don't have uh, something that is uh, specific uh, other than this. Right, perfect. So uh, now the next question is for Dr. Pallavi. Uh, and the question is from Dr. Rakhi Khanna. Dr. Rakhi, are you there? She is a deputy director of toxicology 
in the forensic uh, science lab jaipur yeah sir i'm here and, yes. uh, and i yeah you please ask that directly to dr pallavi right yeah dr pallavi is there uh, yes uh, yeah dr pallavi uh, i would like to know that uh, when you uh, did that histopathological examination and all the review articles of all that uh, neonatals uh, what uh, search you get about uh, the covid 19 uh, that you have uh, mentioned in your uh, work okay uh, thank you for your question uh, so this is very interesting actually when uh, initially there were reports that there is no vertical transmission from mother to the child um, no intrauterine transmission no breast milk transmission and actually we could not find any studies uh, initially till april which said there were like any sars cov transmission from the mother to the neonate but then um, the studies started coming in when they started doing the uh, testing for the neonates probably like after 12 hours after 24 hours and then after 72 hours so without any skin to skin uh, without any uh, breastfeeding without any kind of touch with the mother so then they said like how did the neonates even develop the sars cov so there was a possibility that there was an intrauterine um, possibility of transmission for uh, covid-19 from the mother to the newborn so in case when the mother dies and the neonate also dies what happens so for that there were like some initial studies when there were the placentas which were examined so in the histopathological findings they found that the placenta um i don't know if you want to go like a little back when we talk about sars covid 1 53 percent of the placentas had uh sars covid 1 so there was enough evidence of sars covid 1 being transmitted but sars covid 2 there were no reports but now they have found that there is a possibility of vertical transmission and the placentas will have SARS-CoV-2 infection. So when you do the histopathological uh, findings, you will find that there is a particular macrophage which is uh, very much uh, increased into that particular section. So the macrophages which we could find was CD4, CD123, and CD63. So if you find these three macrophages, uh, there is a very, very, very high possibility. And then probably you could just run an ELISA for the placenta, um, the detached placenta, and then for the newborn uh, autopsy neonate samples, and you could see like there is a presence of the SARS-CoV-2. Oh. Thank so, you, Dr. Pallavi. Yeah. Uh, one, one more question, Dr. Adars, if I can ask <laughs> okay. Dr. Pallavi. I have Please. also written it. Uh, why hydroxychloroquine is uh, much more uh, useful uh, in terms of uh, America and the Europe countries, and but we are not using here in India. Uh, I, I, I know the vision of uh, somebody answers my question that uh, Trump uh, has a policy there, but why? Matlab, uh, I mean to ask uh, why we are not using hydroxychloroquine and they are more relying on this person. As uh, Dr. Pallavi has raised that issue that uh, hydroxychloroquine has been uh, used there. Uh, so I want, would like to get it answered also. So hydroxychloroquine, what we found in our study, so we did actually a comparison between the different uh, continents for the use of different uh, kind of treatment profiles, which they were doing. And we saw that Europe, uh, in particular, um, probably Dr. Maskell would want to see that uh, the Scotland, uh, UK, they were using hydroxychloroquine more than the rest of the Europe. So in the rest of the Europe, probably Sweden, Netherlands, these countries, but not like the rest of the Europe. Germany, I could not find any study. Um, I could not Asia, find any study. In Asia also, you said that, that uh, we have little amount of hydroxychloroquine in Asia also. Uh, we yeah. use less, yeah. So, and then for Asia, most of the studies, I know this could be biased, but most of the studies were from China when we looked at Asia, because the rest of the, I mean, I could just find one study from India where they did not use hydroxychloroquine. So um, the use of hydroxychloroquine was literally not there. I think it's not a trend, but 
it is what it is like europe is going crazy over <laughs> hydroxychloroquine so, so according yeah. to your study you find some some important reason using this hydroxychloroquine there and we are using last year you find something in your research uh not Some really no. Yeah. No, no um no this had like no positive or negative effect on the adverse outcomes because us was really not using any hydroxychloroquine at all and they were having the same adverse outcomes like same <clears throat> uh, preterm birth rate and uh india was also not using and europe was using it so there there's generally no difference and all the clinical trials they just point towards that yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, Pallavi, related thank to your, you thank you, Raki. <coughs> related to your presentation, there are two comments or questions from Malaysia. Both are from Malaysia. One is uh, forensic scientist, Professor Dr. Nataraj Murthy. I think he wants to comment uh, something on your presentation. And there is some question from Ms. Tia Jem uh, from Malaysia. So, Dr. Nataraj, please, you wanted to comment something on this? Are you there, <coughs> Dr. Nataraj? Probably is not there. Do I invite? Uh, I'm, I'm here, Prof. Oh, you are here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here. Sir, so normally some of the things, uh, Prof, because as a toxicologist, I worked in the toxicology division earlier, very, very earlier, in 1977. I was doing the toxicology lines of the human viscera as well as the the animal viscera. Everything had done this one, right? So at that time, sometime, you know, the whenever, uh, suppose somebody is consumed with poison mean, immediately he was taken to the hospital and they are giving the, all the first aid, everything, like their stomach was everything done. Totally the poison was the, removed from the stomach or something like that. So unfortunately, he died. They conducted the autopsy, so it became a medical case. They sent the viscera to the uh, forensic science lab for toxicology analysis. But nothing was there. Normally, already they have done every the all the stomach wash, everything done. So there is no possibility of uh, finding any poison or there. So necessarily we have to give negative. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes what they do is no the police people what they do is so what already we saw this one. I see the froth, everything like that. But in the forensic lab you are giving negative. Negative. What is the meaning of this one? So what to answer? <laughs> we cannot explain the science <laughs> to the so, so, police people there. So okay. likewise, some of the things, you know, even, even sometimes I was doing the prohibition analysis those days in 1979 in Tamil Nadu, the former famous actor MGR was the chief minister of uh, Tamil Nadu. He is against the consuming liquor, right? So at that time, he passed on the order, whoever consuming alcohol in the public, he is immediately taken to the government hospital collected the blood and urine and sent to the forensic lab. I was doing the analysis for two years, uh, Prof. Yeah. But sometimes what happens, you know, so they are, uh, uh, the, uh, the arrest the person at morning 10 o'clock. They collect the uh, blood and urine at evening 3 o'clock, then sent to me. Necessarily, there is no possibility of getting any alcohol. Yeah. But what they do is, you know, this, this is based on my experience. I'm not, I'm not criticizing or commenting anybody else. This is just sharing my experience those days. Right. right. So what I do is, when I do the analysis, I could not find out any alcohol. I myself distilled the blood and urine and do the titration, everything like that. Finally, zero. So what they do is, no, already he is under the influence of alcohol in the public. We arrested, we secured. What the forensic people have done this one? No, what? I could not understand. So these are all the earlier days comments, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There are all yeah. the comments like this one. Anyhow, because yeah, my boss, my yeah. boss, he trusted me. My boss, he trusted me. Oh, no, 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 Nataraj Muthi, oh, he is a very sincere worker like that. So likewise, so toxicology analysis, whatever we do, whatever we discuss or whatever, anything like that, some of the things we could not explain. Yeah, so that's that still true this. today. Yes, I'll, I'll agree with you that it's still true today because when you talk about the negative visra, negative analysis, even if the uh, poison is there, but then the, there are so many circumstances when it's still the visra report comes negative. Both are correct, but then it happens. We need to understand that. And I think we have moved from whatever we used to do 30 years earlier to now. So that was a general comment. I think there's a learning experience uh, uh, from, the, from our previous experience 
experiences but you raised this this point of collection of urine and incidentally someone has asked how do you obtain urine sample from a cops i think uh, this this doesn't fall into the domain of the you can say the toxicologist being a forensic pathologist i can answer this question uh, easily that while we conduct the autopsy if the urine is there we can very easily collect uh, from the bladder itself if it is not there most of the times it is not there when the urine is empty then of course uh, there is no collection of urine but then we emphasize that please do collect uh, urine in all the cases wherever possible because so many drugs and all especially if the issue of drugs is there it is the urine which is the most important matrix and unfortunately because of the you can say uh, the, not the, having the awareness our forensic doctors also sometimes miss that i think uh, uh, we we need to update those gu guidelines of collection of the visra and i think uh, dr deepa verma is there who is the director of fsl and so many forensic toxicologists from delhi and other places are there we are just working on that that how to reduce the visra and there comes the question from uh, our professor ds badkur who has asked that million dollar question which we have been discussing from so many years and again i think we'll be we'll be just discussing on some other fora how to minimize the collection and how to streamline this collection of visra so i think uh, with this we have uh, finished with the uh, with uh, almost all of the questions which were there on various platforms uh, and i don't think there is any question left and now i invite if some uh, other person is there and if he wants to ask uh, some specific question to any speaker or the general speaker or to anyone dr adarsh sir dr singhal yes sir can i take one minute yes please please welcome sir ask uh the one is congratulations to alpha team and the medical legal experts team for this event throughout these two and a half years or slightly more than that i was feeling as if i am on a ship going around the world when i was in egypt i realized the things in egypt are practically same as in india a very important aspect uh, dr noha uh, told all of us that there should be unified treatment guidelines this needs being done in reference to all the developing countries and even in reference to snake bite treatment like who came up in 2015 and government of india in 2016 if we have unified treatment guidelines and diagnosis and treatment this is going to play miracle when uh, we were taken to turkey dr abake highlighted the importance of quadruple time of flight and how it is much better than many others she and dr peter had uh, worked on or mentioned that even if blood urine and vitreous are sent for analysis practically they could be sufficient visra dr kanak highlighted the importance and also she mentioned about few changes that are taking up in reference to sending the visra and she talked of alcohol being the important analyte in reference to almost 40% of cases dr palvi was detail on the different side she apprised us of the treatments and the way how things are different Uh, around the world and in asia it's a question of using more of the traditional drugs like antivirals antibiotics etc etc and therefore this was a different perspective dr peter highlighted one important aspect that out of the xyz deaths which he mentioned about around 2 lakh in scotland or about 9500 under the procurator system it's only 40% in whole post mortem is done that is a very important sentence because in our setup practically every death that occurs and is informed to police since the inquest may not be that active or the details from the doctor may not be proper practically every body, dead body is sent for post mortem thereby increasing the load and it was very interesting to note from dr peter that uh, only 3 4 cases of organophosphorus 
or heavy metals or volatiles he has not come across this was very interesting and overall it was a very pleasant journey where lot of information lot of details uh, were shared with all of us and overall i would like to thank the organizers and giving us an opportunity thank, thank you dr singhal for uh, i think you have some of the the whole gist of the this today's webinar i think it, it touched up on everything <laughs> so that that made my work short before uh, coming on to another question uh, i'll just touch upon this urine collection i think probably uh, i forgot to tell when we are collecting the urine i think we must add some preservative uh, like thymol crystal because in india as we know that there is a lot of time gap between the collection of this various biological materials while transporting and uh, there is whole chain when it it is actually submitted to the fsl Uh, unlike the other uh, country system where the toxicology is usually part and parcel of the department and there is no need to have to add any preservative but when you talk about the urine the the first thing is as much as urine possible maybe 500 ml or so and the thymol must be added so because that was a question a specific question asked by dr juan botha from nigeria or so one comment uh, which i forgot uh, dr tia uh, this miss tia gem from malaysia she wanted to comment upon something on uh, dr pallavi dubey so tia are you there i invite you to just say what you want to convey or you want to ask all right um, thank you so much for this informative platform i always learn so much um i lost all my questions because i was locked out but my question is basically generally for mothers who are expecting or mothers who have given birth already um are the mothers and babies allowed to be in the same room if a mom is actually infected or, or, or is a covid patient right now what happens to breastfeeding will the baby be infected i ask this question because i've got i know a couple of moms who are actually expecting during this pandemic crisis so i'm just very curious curious and concerned about the after effects if you could kindly highlight that for me please thank you so much so i'll i'll keep it short because i know dr adarsh is running out of time so <laughs> thank you um, for the 35 uh, mothers who have delivered in our department uh, we have been doing a retrospective chart review for them and um, we have seen that uh, after the birth there is like a skin to skin um, for the mother and the baby and mostly uh, this time it's not been done uh for the prevention of the aerosolization uh the mothers are kept in a negative pressure room and uh the third thing which is being done is the mothers are being asked if they want to want to do um feeding or they want to like uh do a, a pumping of the breast milk and then they just want to give it to their kids so most of the mothers they are opting for that option because that is a uh, kind of a normal thing and uh, it's kind of a relief to everyone that uh, neonates and children which are uh, of younger age um they are least uh, susceptible and they are uh, you know in the low risk area so most of the neonates which have even gotten the sars cov2 uh, even like the severe ones have been uh, recovered so uh, i don't think there is a there is a problem or there is an elevated risk regarding that the only elevated risk which we saw and which we uh, saw from like most of the studies uh, which we have seen is the is the risk of preterm birth so the severity and that is true for like any kind of uh, pneumonia or for any kind of uh, you know viral infections which we see so it's not different uh, the only risk the uh, that you go into preterm labor uh, so right now this is the only elevated risk and i don't even see the risk of low birth weight as well so so, so babies are not infected if the mother is an existing covid patient if the mother is uh, i'm sorry my <laughs> so um baby can be infected uh, but not too much during the intrauterine transmission because they have seen uh, that during the c section there is it is kind of a little safer 
uh, than the normal deliveries because normal deliveries you have like more uh, skin to skin interaction or you have more lateral vertical interaction and also you need more oxygen support during the uh, stuff so then um, i guess c sections are kind of safer choice um, that is it thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you pallavi thank you uh, professor yeah thank you dear thank you dear to be for being with us all the time in all the webinars thank you for all your support i love your, your session i love this platform so much yeah. thank you yeah so I, i i can see the participants from all over the uh, the world you name the country and and i can see the participants are there of course uh, i can see the chat box there are questions from the different uh, field of the forensics not directly related to the toxicology so because of the shortage of time i will not be able to take them because they are not related to this session maybe they can contact me directly or uh, any time uh, they, they can ask those questions and with this uh, because we have already uh, the exceeded the time limit but because of the certain technical uh, technical glitches in between but uh, then we maintained the time schedule what we initially thought with this i'll extend my sincere thanks to all of the speakers uh, especially dr pallavi because she has to wake up uh, in the very early morning 4 am and along with the kid i can see uh, our son is also there in her lap and she has to manage of course because the time zone differs so ultimately i had to choose this time slot so that uh, the all the speakers uh, can be uh, you can say accommodated uh, thanks to uh, other speakers also dr peter for uh, sparing your valuable time and missing your uh, daughter's uh, last moment when you shifted her to the university and of course dr kanaklata is there uh, from delhi and uh, uh, dr um, uh, this um, uh, i uh, i bk dip uh, from uh, turkey dr noha from uh, egypt for sparing their valuable time and apprising apprising us of their system functioning of this toxicology in their country and related aspect once again thank you all and with this i will hand over this mic to or if any of the part, uh, these speakers or participants if ev wants to convey something i think uh, the floor is open and then afterwards uh, i will hand over this to nilosha no i actually would we just want to thank you for the great invitation and uh, thank you so much for having us with you today thank you uh so uh, i would like to thank all the speakers out there for your valuable time and the great information that you've shared it with us and it was a very amazing session with all of you i also thank our uh, audience who were very patient enough and then also asked questions in a very enthusiastic manner so i would also thank them i also would like to thank our media partners and also our organizers as well thank you all for your time and patience thank you and you all will be getting this uh, you can announce this certificates they will all be getting the e certificates whoever has registered and all that you can announce all the speakers all the participants yes the certificates will be provided in a week or so so within anyways a uh, 10 days of span right so yes thank you so much everyone thank you so see you some other time and some other platform yeah. once again thanks to all thank you thank you yeah, thank you everyone thank you a lot sir